So, good morning everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, may I remind you of a few household um, policy things before we go into the actual proceedings. Please keep wearing your mask whenever you are running around, uh, meeting other people, and take it off only when you are a speaker, or eating or drinking, or sitting down on your socially distant seat. Of course, when you're back home and watching us, then it's up to you how you um, make sure that you are safe, but I do hope that you are safe and sane and stay like that for us for a long time. So let me welcome you. I'm the I'm Thilo Rehren, the A.G. Leventis Professor for Archaeological Science at the Cyprus Institute, and I also serve as a director of Star C. Now, the Cyprus Institute for those of you who may not know it um, in the international audience, is a non-governmental research institute in Cyprus with about 15 years of um, existence. We focus on four major fundamental research topics of importance for the region, for the country, climate, energy and water, uh, high performance computing, and archeology span and cultural heritage which is where the science and technology in archaeology and culture research center to give star C its full name comes in. And in that capacity, I'm very happy to welcome you all here as a, um, as a leader, as a PI of a European Union funded project called Promised, Promoting Science in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is a joint project between the University of Cambridge between the Catholic University in Leuven and us here, which is mostly a training internal collaboration networking program where we work together, scientists and scientists, exchanging best practice, developing protocols and so on to advance the practice of archaeological science. But one of the work packages and I think one of the most important, actually, led by Evi Margarites, my colleague here, is sharing best practice. And that is where we aim to talk, not geek to geek, scientist to scientist, but actually to the people who matter and work with those colleagues who are working in the field, day in, day out, in the museums, in the collections, and see what we can offer that actually makes a difference in their daily practice. So in this context, we have today's workshop on archaeological science methods in the field and in the laboratory, to which I welcome you very much. We have a number of talks coming up. They're always half an hour, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. The discussions are aimed at the live audience here. We have about 15, 20 people that are allowed in the room. We have an off-site room with a few more people who just arrived in Cyprus and still need to be kept under lock, it seems. Um, but if you are internationally visiting and watching us, please do feel free through the YouTube channel to type in questions that we will pick up here and hopefully have time to address as well. Um, most of the speakers will be either here or Skyped in through online connections, and I'm sorry that we have more online lectures now than in-person lectures. That is because Belgium, the home of KU Leuven, recently was um, downgraded to category C country, so two of our speakers at short notice had to go and stay home. Um, also, I would like to alert you, those of you who are well organized and looked at the program a few days back um, to see which lectures you actually want to listen to, that we had a last minute change in the program, again with an international speaker who had a short term um, change in their program at home. So in effect, Professor Matthew Collins, um, speaking on integrated biomolecular analyses, will now give his lecture just before our lunch here at 12.15 Cyprus time, 
10.15 in the UK, 11.15 in Central Europe. And Dr. Anita Radini, looking at beyond bones, will accordingly speak at about two o'clock after lunch, Cyprus time. So I think these are the main announcements I wanted to make, briefly explaining who we are, why we are here, welcoming you all very much. And with that, I would now like to hand over to the first speaker and the brain behind this whole event, Dr. Evi Margaritis. Evi, please come here and tell us everything you know about food production and consumption. Or maybe not everything, not everything but enough for half an hour. Yes, okay, thank you. Thanks, Dilo. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, we have people from Star C and the Cyprus Institute here and the Department of Antiquities that we collaborate uh, uh, with. And uh, as uh, Tilo said, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, food production and uh, consumption and try actually to, to, to have an idea, to, to give you an idea of what we can do, what methods uh, we can have in the field and in the laboratory and what these methods can actually tell us about uh, uh, the past. Yes. So, archaeobotanical macro remains and micro remains. What are the macro remains? Seeds and charcoal, that I'm sure that you all uh, know. But we have micro remains as well, which is starches and uh, phytoliths, where, uh, which uh, studies are not as well uh, developed as uh, macro remains. Of course, we have pollen, but in Cyprus and in Eastern Mediterranean, it's not that um, uh, it's, it's not the, the best environment for, for preservation. Of course, we do have uh, uh, pollen cores in Cyprus as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have isotope and dense in DNA analysis. This, uh, based on these uh, categories, I'm going to give you an overview of what actually we can do uh, with this, what, what kind of information we can, uh, we can gain. So what can they tell us, both macro remains and micro remains? They can tell us about diet. They can certainly tell us about farming regimes crop choices, are they were cultivating for food or fodder? Were they, did we have a, a social status food? We're having food coming from, from elsewhere as an exotic. Uh, and we can identify secondary products. We can identify wine, we can identify uh, processed cereals and uh, uh, legumes, we can identify raisins or beer even. And then they can tell us about landscape modification. What did people uh, do in the past? how they, they modified uh, uh, the landscape, and of course, environmental and climate change, which is a hot topic. Everybody is actually talking about climate uh, change at the moment, but I think that this kind of uh, uh, information can actually tell us something about uh, climate. So let's start from, from the preservation. We're not in Egypt, unfortunately, so we don't have desiccated uh, material. Most of the material in Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean uh, is preserved by charring, and these are seeds and charcoal, of course. And uh, here you can see a very nice uh, flotation machine that uh, a type of it we have uh, made from the, with uh, the Department of Antiquities and uh, Vespo Pilidi some years ago. Uh, and of course, we have uh, uh, waterlogged material as well. It's not very common in Cyprus, but we do have the Mazotos uh, shipwreck. And I'll come back uh, to, to that uh, later, what kind of analysis we're doing uh, with uh, uh, Stella the Mestica. And there, what can, what, what can we uh, say about fruit production and uh, consumption? How can we take uh, our, our information? Crop processing is a key thing. How cereals and pulses, how uh, uh, f uh, food was made, how cereals and pulses were, were, were processed, and how and if we can identify that in the archaeobotanical uh, record. So we have gloom weeds, okay, and we have uh, free threshing cereals. There are two different types of cereals. Free threshing cereals are the ones that when you thresh them, when you do that, the, 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 um, uh, the, the seed, the grain is, is released. So you don't have to have extra processing to release the grain so uh, it's ready for consumption. In gloom weeds, though, which is iron corn emmer and spelt, uh, you cannot do that. When you have the ear, as you, say, as you see here, and then after threshing, you have the spikelet, but in order to actually uh, obtain the grain, so 
uh, to actually have it as a human consumption, you have to have uh, uh, additional processing, which is like, oops, sorry, nope, how do I go back? There, I'm going back. Yes, you can, in order to release uh, uh, the grain here, you have to pound like that, or a little bit char the, the, the spikelets, so the grain is released from, from, from the chaff. And then what you do, and what you find actually in the archaeobotanical record, these are the, 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 the chaff, which is uh, actually what you see here in the, um, in, in the screen. And then after pounding or a little bit of charring, then you have sieving, that you remove chaff and uh, weeds, things that you don't want, that are not cultivating. And then you hand pick uh, uh, all the weeds that are of a similar size with the grain, and then you have uh, the grain. But why is this important? Why is this important if we have free threshing cereals or gloom weeds? It's very important because it has to do about labor. When you need extra processing for gloom weeds, you need more labor through, year, uh, through the year, okay? So that tells you something about the social and economic uh, organization of a, of a site. Here you can see the crop processing sequence from, from, from the threshing all the way to uh, all the steps, the threshing and uh, the winnowing, the sieving, the extra sieving and the hand uh, picking of, uh, of weeds. And this is important because, for example, here at that stage, which is actually you have uh, stored grain and a little bit of, uh, of weeds, you have, uh, we have, we have uh, this situation at Pila where uh, uh, Jan uh, Driesen and uh, Joachim, I can't pronounce his name, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but the directors, yes, exactly, uh, the directors of, of Pila, they have excavated a shaft which there we have found a lot of, uh, of uh, barley grains uh, as uh, stored. The, 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 uh, the key question though there is that we have found grain stored, barley, and then the, the, the chaff that we have found is from a breadweed. So why are they there? Why do you have a mixture of these uh, two things? Were they uh, uh, cultivated together as maslin? Were they stored, uh, storing barley and then they stored uh, bread wheat, were they using the chaff for bedding for the, for the moisture, for the chaff? All these questions we're going to, uh, to find. And then in, this, in the first uh, uh, stages of crop processing, we have the assemblage of Erimi, where there we don't have anything stored, we haven't found any stored uh, cereals or legumes, but we do have a lot of, um, of weeds. And that's, uh, that's an indication of what? Is it an indication of crop processing, that they had crop, crop processing on site? Or are they, were, were they collecting deliberately wild uh, plants for different purposes? Uh, that's uh, a question that we're going to, uh, to explore. But this is just to give you an idea how different crop processing stages can actually identify and give the economic uh, activities of a site, which are, which are different. The thing, to, to come back to, 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 the, to, the, to the Bronze Age, uh, because these, these two sites are, are Bronze Age, and with Abelia as well, that, and Dagios Ozomenos that Vespo Pilidis uh, is, uh, is digging, we are going to have it, a completely different uh, idea of Bronze Age Cyprus. Because from the Neolithic, we do have a lot of information. There are PhD theses, there are very active teams, uh, in Cyprus that they are digging the Neolithic, and we do have, we do know what was going on. The Bronze Age, though, is unexplored. We have patchy evidence, and now only we're, uh, we're trying to actually understand what's uh, going on, and not only from, uh, from the seeds and the environmental uh, part, from animal bones as well, uh, the work that Anna Spiru is doing and uh, other colleagues, they're going to change what we know about uh, Bronze uh, Age Cyprus, or at least we hope that uh, we're, we're going to, to, to know more. Um, what uh, crop processing is not only about, uh, we, we don't have information only on cereals and pulses, we have on olives. So if you find an assemblage of olives that are crushed, you can actually identify in the archaeobotanical record what stage uh, uh, this is coming from. Are they uh, the, pro the, uh, the remnants of the production of, uh, of olive oil or they were uh, crushed during troubling uh, at the excavation, during excavation or during flotation? You can identify that. And the same 
you can, uh, you can identify also what kind of installations were used to produce uh, uh, olive oil. And most of the times, and especially in prehistoric type, times, you don't have the installations. I mean, for example, if you, if you find a roller like that, it, you're not going to immediately think that they are crushing olives uh, with, but it is used for that. It is only later uh, in, the, in the classical period where you have the mills and the trapetum that you can actually say, oh yeah, something is going on uh, here like olive oil production. Uh, in Cyprus, we do have uh, the Calabasos Agios Dimitrios uh, installations, which again, it, it's a question mark what the, the, they were used for because we don't, we don't have the, the, the analysis uh, for it. We assume though that it was for, uh, for olive oil. Uh, the same goes for, the, for wine and how we can identify wine, um, what we find at the archaeobotanical record. We can identify if what we find is, is the remnants of actually treating the grapes. So you find a lot of grape pips, a lot of uh, stalks and stuff like that, a lot of uh, pressed skins, or you can actually find what is going on in the pithos for storing, so what actually uh, is there as, uh, as, as uh, wine. And again here, you don't find, uh, sorry, you don't find the installations uh, very often in prehistoric times. For example, look, you have wooden uh, installations. A lot of the installations, I think at least during prehistory, but later as well, were located in the field, so you're not going to, uh, to find them. We know from the ethnographic record that they were located in the fields, but there were some of them, they were common as well. They were used from different uh, households, so there you can make assumptions of how uh, uh, economy was, uh, was actually uh, organized. And here is what we find at the archaeobotanical record. Here are uh, grape, uh, grape pips from Abella that uh, Vespopilidis is, uh, is digging. Uh, here are pressed grapes that we haven't found in Cyprus, but they are from, uh, from different uh, uh, sites in Greece, which they're indicative of pressed grapes. I mean, you don't, you don't press grape unless you want to, to, to make wine. So when you find that such ensembles with pressed grapes, that you can see, look, you can see the, the, the skin around the pip, then it's an indication of somebody actually pressed the grapes to, pro, to produce some kind of, uh, of liquid. And then what else we have? We have raisins, and these, are, these ones are, are uh, from Abella, where, uh, where Vespo is excavating around Pithy, we found a lot of cereals, but we did find uh, uh, complete grapes. And we know from, uh, from uh, experimental work that when you find this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, whole grapes and you can see actually the pip uh, in, uh, in there, the grape pip, they are not represent fresh grapes, they represent raisins. And this is important because it, 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 it's a process of the grape. You don't, have, you don't store the fresh grapes, you create another product. You create raisins, so they trade them, they keep them for, for, for longer, and it's very, uh, and it's very important. Um, le let's, let's see what, what else we can do with the olives, apart from if, when we say that um, we, can, we can detect if it's uh, uh, olive oil production or not. Uh, here are the Mazotos uh, uh, olive uh, stones, and what uh, we, we are doing is uh, with the University of Montpellier and Clemence Pagnou, uh, what we're doing is that we take pictures of all these uh, olives, the complete olives, okay? Uh, you take two, pic two pictures, uh, you can see the method here, it's, it's called the geometric uh, morphometry, and then uh, you, you put them in R, it's a, statist a statistical program, and uh, Montpellier has the biggest uh, reference collection on olive uh, stones and grape pips in the Mediterranean. Uh, I think it's, the, it's the, uh, uh, the best and the most numerous. So what they have done is they have gone through the Mediterranean countries, West Mediterranean as well, but East. Uh, Cyprus, not so much, so possibly we can help them with, uh, uh, with that. And they have uh, photographed and actually have this, uh, that method in modern materials. And what they do is that they compare the uh, archaeobotanical uh, materials with a, with a modern uh, collection. The Mazotos, uh, uh, the Mazotos material is very important for that because it's waterlogged. 
when you have charred material, uh, uh, it, they shrink, they, they change uh, the, the size and sometimes shape as well. But wa with waterlogged material, this is not happening. So it's a very good case study to actually test what's going on. So according to, to, to Stella, the Mestica, they have the, the amphora there is from Hios, I think. So one of the, of the questions is that, okay, what kind of, of variety the olives were? They, were they from, from, from Hios? or they were Cypriot, they were East Mediterranean going to here, what was the, the question? And the other method that we, tr we will try to do uh, is that we're going to, to try and do ends in DNA, and I'll come back to that uh, at the end of, of the lecture, because waterlogged material is very suitable for, for ends in DNA. Chard, not so much, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll come to that uh, later. Uh, we don't have, the, we don't have uh, uh, archaeobotanical remains only in, um, in domestic uh, sites. We have in, uh, in funerary sites as well, and this is a, a very nice uh, uh, middle Hellenic grave from Argos at a space that uh, Anna and Zil to say, uh, are excavating. And the thing is that uh, what we know for the funerary practice of the, of the middle Hellenic is that they were uh, burying uh, people without any uh, votives, nothing, they were no, no offerings at all. So you have plain uh, graves without any, uh, not even uh, pottery. And now when we did sample for archaeobotanical remains, and there comes what uh, Ephemia uh, digs at uh, Alabra that we did take uh, uh, samples, we found there that they were putting uh, uh, plant remains inside the graves and some of, uh, sometimes on top of them. So what we knew for the funerary uh, practice of the Medichelladic changed because of the geobotanical remains. Now, what is needed for all these uh, nice things that I, uh, that I, I told you? It's not uh, uh, in the field, as mo most of you know, and we have done with, the with a lot of excavations of the Department of Antiquities, you need to take samples. The problem is, and uh, for the people that of uh, the colleagues here, uh, they, they, they know that better than me, is not that we cannot just take, okay, I'll take one or two samples and uh, we'll see what happens. We need to have the research questions that we can actually set up in the beginning of the project. What do we want to know about uh, the site? So that's why we do uh, sampling. Because uh, it's, you take the samples and then you have the, 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 the very important question of storing. Where are you going to put the, the, the samples? Are, do you have any water? Do you have any, any, anybody to process? Uh, the samples, we do at the Department of Antiquities, but it's not, it's not uh, easy. Do, do we have somebody to sort the residues for other material as well? So the, all these uh, uh, parameters are difficulties. So for the people that they don't do that, I can relate why they don't uh, do it, but here we are to help and uh, set up uh, a pipeline for, for that. So say that we do take uh, uh, the samples, and you have the archaeobotanists to actually study them, then you need modern reference material that we're, uh, we're trying to have here at, um, at the Cyprus Institute, and we're collaborating with the Agricultural Research Institute and the Department of uh, Forestry. And uh, here is a very nice picture of modern uh, uh, seeds that Caroline Duchet has, uh, has photographed for us, and uh, she, she, she digitizes uh, the reference collection. And then what you find at the Archaeobotanical Record, you actually, uh, you need the reference collection to, uh, uh, to compare it and identify them. And here, I said about Montpellier uh, le, uh, earlier, that they have one of the biggest reference collection of olive stones and olive seeds. But here at Starcy, we have one of the biggest, if not the biggest, of experimentally uh, charred uh, grape and olive, oil and olive remains of uh, uh, wine production and olive oil production. So each step of the process of wine production, we took samples and we charred them. Each step of the olive oil production, we took uh, samples and we charred them. So uh, we have them here uh, in, uh, in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. um, Stats and phytolith analysis. Now it's something that we don't do uh, very, very often, not many excavations do. Phytoliths are uh, very minute uh, silica uh, components of, of the plant. When the plant decays, you have silica components and they go into the, into the soil and you find them. Uh, the same with starch uh, 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 granules. 
the thing is that it, it's more difficult, starch and phytochemical analysis is more difficult than uh, uh, archaeobotanical remains, macro remains. And that's why and, uh, the, the, the difficulty lies on the expense, on how expensive uh, they are, because for the archaeobotanical remains, for the seeds and charcoal, you do need a lot of soil to be processed and stuff like that, but then the cost is not that much. For starch analysis and phytochemical analysis, you do need a lot of chemicals, you do need a lot of preparation and sample preparation so you can actually uh, take them from, uh, retrieve them from the, from the soil. And it, it's time consuming and it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, however, I think that it's, it's worth it. And here you can see what we can, we can do and you, we can actually take additional information about, uh, from groundstone tools because as you know, people were were making gruel, they were making bulgur, they were, make, they were processing flour, uh, cereals and legumes for, for flour, and there we can see it at the, at the surface of the ground stone tools. But what we can do on the ground stone tools and on pottery is extract starch and phytoliths. And how do we do that? It's, it's, not, uh, it's, uh, it's very easy, the sample uh, preparation is very easy. You take, uh, oops, sorry, you take uh, uh, here from inside the ground stone tools or inside the pottery, you take what is there, the soil really, you process it with, um, uh, with water, with still, the, distilled water, and then you add the chemicals and, and uh, extract the starches and uh, uh, the phytoliths. And here is one of the, of, uh, of the analysis that, that Juanjo Garcia Granero has done at the University of Barcelona, and he did it from the site at Stavropol and Thermi in Greece, and uh, that uh, he has found crust inside uh, the, uh, the pottery vessels, and he could actually say what we were cooking, in which temperature they were cooking, and cooking methods. So it's an extra uh, it, it, it's an extra uh, level of information that we didn't have before. What also what starches and phytoliths have as an advantage is that you don't have to have, uh, they don't have to, have to be uh, charred. So you don't have to have a fire uh, a destruction layer or you don't have, uh, you don't need to have the medium of fire for starches and phytoliths to be preserved. And when you combine all this, when you combine archaeobotanical analysis, macro remains and micro remains, as, as, as uh, I just told you, you have uh, the whole approach of, of domestic food related activities. You, have, you, can, you can talk about production because you have storage, you know what they were producing, what they were cultivating, and this goes from the macro remains, the seeds. You can find how they were grinding uh, cereals and pulses, and this is from uh, phytoliths and starches. How they were cooked, and this is again from phytoliths and starches. Sometimes we do have lumps of, uh, uh, charred lumps that we don't know what the, the, they are, macro remains, and there with uh, scanning electron microscope you can see minute par practic uh, particles of, uh, of uh, 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 processed cereal possibly, or uh, legumes, and there you can see that yes, maybe it's bread, or maybe something kind of a filo pastry or something like that. And then, of course, you have information about consumption because you do, uh, you, you have that from uh, inside the, the vessels. An extra thing that people can do, an extra analysis that people can do from the same, from the same vessels that they took samples for starches and phytoliths, they, took, they take a small piece of, um, of, the, of the vessel and they do residue analysis. So you have the, the, the whole thing. So if the liquids they were stored there, you can find that information as well. But this again is very costly. It cannot happen in, uh, in, in Cyprus. What we aim for starts and phytolis analysis here at uh, the Cyprus Institute is to actually be able to prepare the samples. So for, to, to do the sampling, to take the, the pottery from Alabra and uh, Abella, bring them here, take the samples, and process it to the, t to the, uh, to the level that the specialist can actually see what kind of, uh, of starts or uh, phytolith uh, uh, is, uh, uh, represent. And then, of course, you can have a lot of information about disposal, and there is where macro and micro remains are, are uh, uh, giving us information. What we find 
on the floors of the settlements, what we found in the pits of the settlements, and how refuse was organized, and um, uh, what can tell us about uh, uh, the site. Now, at, at, what else we can do? We can do staple asset analysis. And this, is, this can be done, of course, on cells, uh, on animal bones. Anna is going to talk uh, about it uh, later for animal uh, bones. But of course, we can do it on seeds and, and uh, uh, charcoal. On, for, for seeds, you can, we can have uh, carbon isotopes, stable carbon isotopes, because they, they, they can uh, give you information about water status and humidity. If they were, they, we had drought uh, episodes, if the crops were uh, watered or not. And then the nitrogen isotopes can talk about manuring, and manuring by itself maybe doesn't show anything, so okay, they were manured, but it does say, it does uh, indicate that we have intensified uh, farming uh, regimes. People were going and manuring uh, their fields, or they had small gardens close to the, to the site, so they can manure them, and so it was very intensified. It was an, an extensive uh, uh, farming regime. And of course you have, uh, before, before uh, I say that, it's not, uh, not many people do isotopes easily, because, especially in, in Cyprus, because in order to uh, actually have any meaning, uh, meaningful re results, you need a baseline for, for Cyprus, what the modern uh, situation is on Cyprus. And now we are creating, we're trying to create that through uh, PROMIS. And I'm sure that uh, uh, we're going to apply that to the botanical and archaeological uh, uh, record. Uh, but at the moment, we need to take the samples and send them abroad so we can have uh, uh, the, the results. And finally, we, we get to ancient DNA. There is, a, is a challenging because ancient DNA can give us a lot of information, especially for the biogeography of the species, uh, where the domestication centers are. Uh, because of uh, ancient day, DNA, what we know about cereal pulses or fruit trees has changed completely in the last uh, decade. We thought that we had only one center of domestication, say for the olive and the grape, but now we have in Armenia and the Caucasus area, and uh, recently uh, the Spanish uh, suggest because of DNA uh, uh, evidence that there was another uh, domesticated, uh, domestication center for olive in Western Mediterranean. So what we knew with the traditional methods it, uh, has uh, completely changed. As I said though earlier, for, uh, for, the, for the seeds, it's not easy to, to extract uh, ancient DNA because it's hard. Uh, there are methods and the, the good thing is that they, they change all the time, they change rapidly. So maybe uh, this year we cannot do it, but in six months maybe uh, things uh, uh, are going to change. Um, the, the, the whole thing that I, I try to, to, to say and uh, about what we can do uh, in the field. I'll come, I'll come back to what I said briefly in the beginning. It's all about what kind of questions we're asking. Uh, we, we haven't, I feel at least, that we haven't escaped the appendix syndrome. A lot of uh, colleagues, a lot of uh, colleagues, archaeologists uh, of the field, uh, not only Cyprus, all over uh, the East Mediterranean, they think that uh, uh, we have an appendix for the seeds, we have an appendix for, for the bones, and that's it. This is not uh, the correct way, of course, to, to go about it. Um, and it, 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 I think we're missing the, the, the point, not only about sampling and what we ask the specialist, uh, we, we, we miss the point that a lot of people, they're, they're freelancers, they, they need to, to, to get paid, the excavations, they need to actually have a budget for this kind of, uh, of analysis. And sometimes we don't have that in the, in the back of our, of our, of our uh, uh, mind. And this needs to change if we actually uh, want to go further. Uh, in 1976, uh, Jane Renfrew published a book that it was called First Aid for Seeds. And that was like in 1976. Uh, we have gone a long way since uh, then. But I think we can, we can do better here and in other places of Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. Oh, questions, yes. There's a lot of uh, complex detail in here, obviously. It's amazing to see how much of that 
stuff survives at the end of the cooking process. Now, if I look at, at my kitchen, when I finish cooking, I actually can relate to that. Um, so, we have time for a few questions, please. Somebody wants to volunteer with the staff uh, starting? Yes. Yes, Tessa. Hi. Thank you, Evie, for this uh, talk. It was really informative, especially for those who have no idea about seats and uh, what you do. That was the idea. Yes, yes, exactly. It was a really nice introductory topic. So I was just wondering, uh, we in osteoarchaeology, for example, uh, we have this osteological paradox uh, in terms of biases, in terms of preservation. And uh, I was wondering that we always uh, take into consideration. Uh, I was wondering what is happening with uh, the biases that you have in your field. Mm -hmm. Um, how does uh, the preservation, how do you account for the preservation issues? How is pre representative they are, for example? Can you talk to us about this? Yes. I mean, because you talked about how the uh, things changed in terms of uh, what we knew about the seeds and the, the olive oil in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the regions, but um, are the samples representative enough to, be, to talk about this? Um, this is my Thank you. Okay. Uh, of course, you, you, the, the first thing, the first bias that w uh, we have, uh, apart from sampling, which I'll come back to it, it's about the preservation. If you, if you don't have fire, you're not going to find anything. I mean, you, you're not going to find uh, seeds. So there are sites that, of course, they were having plant remains, they were cooking, they were storing, but because there wasn't any fire, you, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't find anything. The other thing that it's very important and for us archaeobotanists to actually interpret and for archaeologists to understand is, uh, I'll give you an example. We find uh, an area of, uh, with Pithy, okay. Uh, at Abella, with Vespa, we were lucky because you had, uh, it was a, a fire destruction. So what it was there around the Pithy represented what it was in, in the Pithy. You have other situations though, that you have plant remains, charred plant remains, and you don't have any fire destruction. Or you have uh, plant remains inside the pithos, which uh, you don't have uh, evidence of fire at the pithos or at the area around the pithos. So there, of course, what is in the pithos, it's a secondary uh, deposition or a tertiary uh, deposition. You cannot say, oh, I found olives in the, in the, in the pithos, we have uh, olives there, because you have to interpret and understand how was the taphonomical, wh what were the taphonomical factors that actually created the situation for the olive seeds to be in this, um, in this pithos. And that was certainly not because of a fire destruction and certainly not because they were olives uh, in, stored in, in the pithy. So that's a, a great, uh, a, a great uh, bias. Another one, a, a, as you, you said very correctly, is what we compare. Uh, for example, uh, we can compare, let's talk about uh, Cyprus, we can compare the Neolithic of Cyprus. We have evidence. The Bronze Age, now we are, we are creating. Or take uh, early Bronze Age Greece, very biased uh, 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 situation because you have uh, sites like Keros, so I can, okay, I can talk about uh, uh, where I'm excavating, in which you, you sample everything, you sample every context, and then you have other early Bronze Age sites that they're not uh, sampled very intensively, or they're not excavated in uh, such a large um, area. So there you cannot compare. It's, it's, it's very difficult. The other, difficult. the other major difficulty is how you compare data sets. It's very, it's very, of course we have, as you do, osteology, you have specific way of recording and stuff like that. But again, it's very difficult to, to, to compare. Maybe you said that you need charring the material to be preserved. Is there any in this region of the world? I mean, any chance for waterlogged or mummified finds it's, um, we need to watch out for? Yes, I, I mean, as we said, uh, waterlogged uh, mazotos because of the of the shipwreck around the area of uh, of lakes, maybe, but we don't have uh, in Cyprus that I'm aware of anyway. And of course, you, you have mineralized seeds. And when you find mineralized seeds, it's not very common, but it, you, you, you do find them. Uh, most likely, it's, it's, uh, they have gone through your digestion uh, system. So you can, you can actually uh, identify the area where you find in a very, very specific way. Uh, and uh, then you have uh, close to metals. 
yeah. who are loath to, to copper because there you don't have the activity of the uh, of bacteria, so, yes, of the soil. So you actually, it, it's a very, very uh, great uh, example at Corinth in a big uh, copper, uh, 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 yes, uh, Hitra. Uh, they have found uh, uh, pomegranates, complete pomegranates though. So they, they're like that, they have, they have shrunk and it, it's a pity because you cannot really see them. The conservators do not allow you to see them, so you like that, but they are complete ones. And because of the, of the copper, they, they survive. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Excavators <laughs> do not necessarily take samples, yes. do not depend so much on the collection yes. of samples. Yes. So there is a very big lack of evidence. You, you, you're very right oh, that for the Iron Age and the classical uh, period, yeah. and uh, now it's changing, and I don't, I don't say that because you're in the room, but you were one of the first that we, we took samples from Pasivi, which is the historical uh, period. And which were very useful. Were, were yeah. useful, of course. And I, I remember, I'll, I'll say a, 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 a brief line about it. In Greece, at some point, we were in a very big site and saying, okay, are you going to take a classical site? Okay, a lot of inscriptions and stuff like that. So I was going to the excavator and said, like, can we take samples? Like, it's going to be so cool and stuff. He said, Evi, inscriptions do not float. You know, like, okay. <laughs> but uh, we did it. We made, uh, we made the effort and uh, we have great results, but it, it's changing. In, in Greece, it's, yeah. uh, it's changing, yes, yes. But I think that's a very common bias that the application of archaeological science is much more advanced yes. in the prehistory yes. and less so in the historical periods, yes. even though we can offer a lot of um, information there. It is changing, though. Now, that stuff that you showed looks horribly fragile and tiny. Well, How do we make sure in the excavation process to actually retrieve it and to preserve it so that you and your colleagues can then work with the excavator to unravel that information potential? Uh, it's always, it always surprises me because there are so minute things, but they are very determined to survive. Like, no, I'm going to make it uh, to the microscope. I'm going to survive uh, at the excavation. If, for example, a lot, of, a lot of people, they scratch the soil with the uh, trowel. That's, that's very bad because then whatever you have there, it, uh, it's going to be uh, to, to, to destroy. So you can do that lumps of soil intake. And uh, what is very, is very uh, bad is when you store soil or when we store soil in plastic bags and leave it for a long time and it's a little bit uh, moisture and then it's going to, uh, some, sometimes I have found actually plants going into <laughs> the soil, which was very interesting. So there you're not going to find uh, anything. But even for, if, if, the, if the soil is stored correctly and not moist, it can survive for, for like you can do it, it's okay if you do it after some months, if you, if you process it after some, uh, some months. Uh, that, and a lot of dry, yes, it has to be dry. So it has to be carefully excavated, stored in dry conditions, processed quickly. Quickly is, is a, <laughs> again, it's a, it's a bias. It depends if we have the equipment, but it, it can go for the next season. Let's, uh, let's say that we excavated this year and we can process it the next season. Is there something like that first aid for seeds, um, which is now almost half a century old, something up to date and for this region? There are a lot of, uh, there is a very, very good uh, uh, book uh, by Purcell that it, it, so it shows um, uh, different methods and how actually we can excavate seeds or how we can preserve seeds. So yeah. yes, the, the, there are handbooks at the moment, yeah. So that I think is very important to preserve the information yes. at the moment of excavation. Good, <laughs> any more questions from the audience? Do we have any write-in questions? Oh yes. Hello, seeds that have been consumed. Has there been any um, uh, data based on tombs and seeds? So from that, uh, in, from, from uh, consumption, <laughs> <laughs> or, or is that a... No, I think that what we find in, inside the tubes in this region, okay, because 
for example, if you have the Iceman in uh, the Alps, and then you can find the seeds that he has in his stomach, and we're all very happy, but this is not what we find uh, here. I, I, they, they, put it as a, they put the seeds as, as, as a votive, as an offering, and I, I, at, I at least think that in some cases they char them before, and they put them charred inside uh, uh, the grave to be, to be preserved with, uh, with the dead, yes. Well, it's a long story there. <laughs> we can give you the reference because if we start that conversation, it's going to go a long, a long way. Yeah, so charring doesn't necessarily mean accidental no, charring. No, it can be very, very um, specific. specific. Intentional. Yes, intentional. Yeah. Which showed actually not only that they were doing it intentionally, but that they had a great a control of fire and fire conditions, as you know from metallurgy and glass making anyway. So. Well, if you char it in the bronze crucible, then I think you Not in the bronze crucible, but somewhere else. <laughs> Good. Thank, thank you, you very much, Eddie. Thanks, thanks. And thanks again to the audience. We have now about... Ah, yes. Are you, are you going to, do, to, to present to the others? I'm <laughs> now inviting everybody to have a short break oh, okay. so that we will start with the next speaker at quarter to 11 Cypriot time, which is probably in five, seven minutes. So then I'll see you again here, I hope.
Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. May I kindly ask you to take your seats and be ready for the next lecture of the morning. I'm delighted to invite Dr. Anna Spiru to the podium here from the Cyprus Institute to talk about exploring human-animal interactions in the past and to show what actually can be learned from looking at dead animal bones. It's also actually a talk suitable for vegetarians. Anna, please come. <laughs> Good morning and uh, welcome to this online workshop dedicated to archaeological science methods in the field and laboratory. Uh, we are now moving to animals and the scientific tools and techniques employed in the uh, uh, archaeological study of their physical remains. Uh, I will start this presentation by providing uh, a brief overview of zooarchaeology, including definitions a description of the nature of the discipline and a brief historical background. Uh, I will then introduce some of the main materials and methods uh, used by zooarchaeologists in the field and laboratory for the recovery, analysis, and eventual interpretation of animal remains. I will discuss issues relevant to the preservation and conservation of osseous material uh, before and after excavation, focusing specifically on Cyprus. Uh, lastly, I will introduce two scientific techniques uh, which are becoming particularly popular uh, during the last few decades, stable isotopes uh, and ancient DNA, and the potentials and limitations of both methods in addressing archaeological questions in Cyprus and beyond. Uh, today, several definitions for zooarchaeology can be found in Wikipedia and in textbooks, but I always like to use the one given by uh, British zooarchaeologist Juliet Glatton Brock, uh, according to whom uh, zooarchaeology is a branch of archaeology that studies animal remains from archaeological sites with the aim to reveal the roles played by animals that coexisted and interacted with human societies over millennia. Uh, and I really like this definition because it highlights the words coexistence and interaction, highlighting the mutualistic relationship between humans and other animals. Uh, and it is exactly this interaction that distinguishes zooarchaeology from its sister discipline, paleontology. While paleontology study the remains of animals themselves, including also animal species that have not coexisted and not interacted with humans, so archaeologists always study animals with reference to humans. Uh, during the course of our evolution, we have developed a remarkably rich and varied set of interactions with other animals. Um, we are using them uh, for food, for entertainment and sports, uh, and these boards sometimes can take very cruel forms like bullfighting. We are using them in agriculture and transport. We worship them. A characteristic example is cow worship in India. Um, we keep them as companions and we are using them in scientific research. Uh, so archaeology, like most branches of archaeology, lies at the interface of humanities and sciences. Uh, because it focuses on addressing anthropological questions relevant to the economic, cultural, social, and symbolic roles that both wild and domestic animals have played in human societies by borrowing techniques and methods from uh, various scientific disciplines, including earth sciences, biogeochemistry, uh, molecular biology, uh, zoology, and others. Um, at its very beginning, so archaeology had a very specific and a very narrow purpose to provide excavators with lists of the animal species represented at given archaeological sites without any attempt to place animals in their wider economic, cultural, social, and historical context of the site uh, and period under study. This approach is widely known as the laundry list approach. During the last 50 years, with the development of new archaeology, the scene uh, has changed completely, and animal remains have become essential components of every single archaeological study. Uh, they provide information on key topics relevant to human evolution, 
including important uh, shifts in human prehistory, like the transition from scavenging to hunting and from hunting to animal domestication. They can provide information on food procurement, food processing and cooking methods, ancient technologies, trade and exchange of animals and animal products, uh, and seasonality. But apart from economic questions, though, archaeology can also provide information um, on social issues like animal sacrifices, feasting, uh, and food taboos. The recent growth of biogeochemical approaches, especially the application of stable isotopes, has brought in our knowledge of prehistoric animal management practices, while the extraction of ancient DNA in form of prehistoric animal translocations. Uh, one of the most significant contributions of ADNA studies, as we will see later on in this presentation, is they are potential to reveal the genetic and cultural history of many currently endangered indigenous uh, animal breeds and to contribute to conservation biology. Um, animal remains do not only include the bones of uh, large mammals, but all the hard and soft tissues of vertebrates and invertebrates that can be found at archaeological sites. Uh, this might include the shells of crustaceans, horns and antlers, fish uh, otoliths. Uh, these are tiny carbonate structures uh, found uh, in the inner ear of fish, and they can be used for seasonality studies and for reconstructing paleoclimate, so they are very important. Uh, in addition, bone artifacts, incised uh, bone, uh, mummies, and coprolites are also studied uh, by zooarchaeologists. Uh, the most commonly used cheap and fast method for the retrieval of animal remains is hand collection, which relies on the observation skills of the archaeologist. Now, the main problem with hand collection is a visual bias resulting in only larger uh, and more visible bones being collected. Uh, and of course, even though time-consuming flotation is the best method for the retrieval of faunal remains because it allows the recovery of even tiny bones, uh, like bones of micromammals, birds, uh, and fish, and of course, fish otoliths. Now, bone preservation. Uh, the state of bone preservation is one of the most crucial factors uh, in deciding which method or approach we are going to use for the analysis of animal remains and the kind of archaeological questions we are going to ask. It is very important to know the limitations of our material before writing ambitious research proposals, and this is a lesson that I've learned since I moved to Cyprus, that it's, it's very important to know the state of preservation and what you can do uh, with the material. Uh, the state of preservation and the level of bone diagenesis, with the term diagenesis we refer to all the natural uh, and chemical factors that affect the bone. Um, uh, so natural factors affecting the bone before excavation include the abundance and composition of groundwater. Humidity, uh, it's, it's a very detrimental factor for the bone because it releases the bone between the organic and the inorganic matter and can cause breakage. Uh, abrupt changes in temperature uh, can cause easily cracking of the bone. The composition of the soil is very important, so highly alkaline and highly acidic soils can destroy the bone. And of course, the structural properties of the bone. If we have bones with very low uh, structural density, like ribs or skulls or vertebrae, usually this uh, kind of bone destroys. If we have uh, bones with uh, high structural densities, like long bones, um, uh, bone diaphysis, these kind of bones are usually uh, better preserved. Um, the main factors affecting, affecting bone preservation in Cyprus include, of course, humidity, soil geochemistry, as well as plowing activities. Uh, Cyprus soils, especially in the western parts of the island, um, are highly alkaline, contributing to the quick degradation of hydroxyapatite, the inorganic matter of the bone, while highly acidic soils in the southern and central parts of the island contribute to the degradation of organic matter, uh, the collagen. 
Even though there are not many things we can do to control uh, the impact of natural factors on bones, we can certainly try to reduce factors which can damage the bone during and after excavation. This can be achieved through careful handling, cleaning, and storage of bones uh, in plastic boxes instead of using plastic bags and uh, open plastic craters. Uh, special care should be given to fragile materials such as uh, articulated bones or skulls, which most of the time disintegrate soon after they are retrieval. So we should be very careful with the storage uh, of, of animal bones. Um, a good way of recording, preserving, and conserving fragile remains in the field of, or museum is using 3D technologies. Uh, here at Star C, we have just started uh, digitizing several modern animal bone reference collections uh, by using a 3D Next Engine scanner. Uh, while the main aim of our digitization project is to create an online reference collection that could be used by both specialists and non specialists for both research and educational purposes, our longer term plan is to include also archaeological specimens and raise public awareness on the importance of animal remains, highlighting their value as archaeological materials that should also be exposed uh, to the wider public and not just remain in the storage rooms of museums. Um, after this short review of zooarchaeology and its practicalities, I will now move to the main part of this uh, presentation to introduce two scientific techniques that dominate zooarchaeological studies staple isotopes and ancient DNA. Um, I will not try to get into the very fine details of these methods, but I will rather focus on explaining how they have been used so far on the island and their potentials and limitations for addressing archaeological questions on Cyprus and beyond. Uh, both techniques are invasive or partially invasive, which means that they require small portions of bone to be uh, removed and damaged. They both require good knowledge of the main principles of bone chemistry. In addition, stable isotopes and ancient DNA studies can help us to address questions that cannot be directly addressed through traditional zooarchaeological methods, including ones concerning animal management, animal translocations, and they can help us to reveal the genetic and evolutionary history of various animal breeds contributing to conservation biology. But what are isotopes and how they can inform uh, zooarchaeological investigations? Isotopes are atoms of the same element that have an equal number of protons and an equal number of neutrons. They can be divided into two categories, radio radioactive, which decay over time and are important tools for dating archaeological materials like carbon-14, uh, and stable isotopes, which have a stable nucleus that does not decay. Their abundance allows many useful applications in archaeology. Isotopes are present everywhere in the world we live and breathe, but the ratios in which different isotopes of the same element occur vary between different substances, for example, differ between different types of food uh, and ecosystems. There are many stable isotopes that are used by zooarchaeologists. However, the most popular ones are carbon and nitrogen, which can provide information on animal diet, including foddering practices, oxygen, which can provide information on paleoclimate and past ecologies, and lastly, strontium isotopes, which can be used for understanding animal movement and migration. As animals grow and their tissues continually renew themselves, the isotopes that are in the food they eat and the water they drink are being incorporated into all of their body tissues, including their skeleton. Bones and teeth are the two main tissues used by zooarchaeologists to study stable isotopic signatures. Teeth are generally preferred because they are more resistant to diagenesis and they are better preserved compared to bone collagen. Uh, isotope ratios are measured using analytical instruments. Um, some of them are very complex and they are known as isotope ratio mass spectrometers, like the one you can see uh, on the picture located at the Max Planck uh, Institute in Vienna. Um, now, there are only a handful of isotopic studies devoted to animals in prehistoric Cyprus. 
We have an unpublished dissertation by Caitlin Di Benedetto, uh, looked into wild and domestic animal management practices during the pre-pottery Neolithic. In addition, Angelos Hachigumis has recently studied bird seasonality for domestic caprines during the PPNP uh, by integrating high resolution oxygen stable isotopes and ethnographic uh, data. And as uh, Evie said before, one of the main problems uh, in Cyprus is the lack of baseline. So we really need to work uh, together on um, developing some good baselines. An animal that has received little attention from zooarchaeological research, despite its economic, cultural, and symbolic significance, is the cow. This is mainly because caprine bones are much more frequent in prehistoric sites uh, across the island and outnumber those of cattle. After their introduction during the pre-pottery uh, Neolithic period, cattle disappeared from Cyprus for four millennia to reappear again during the early Bronze Age. We do know from faunal studies that cattle were used mainly as agricultural engines and as beasts of burden, while the presence of cattle bones in tombs and in the island's rich iconographic record suggests that cattle had a very special position in the lives of early Bronze Age communities and that they received different treatment than domestic caprines. Now the question is, can this different treatment also be reflected in the animal's dietary patterns and by extension in their isotopic signatures? Uh, in order to explore these questions, we applied oxygen and carbon stable isotopic analysis on 30 cattle and 10 caprine teeth from two early Bronze Age settlements. Our results indicate that cattle had distinctive stable isotope values and therefore different diets from domestic caprines. This difference is significant and may relate to distinct patterns of foraging behavior between cattle and caprines different grazing areas explored by caprine and cattle, and three fodder provisioning. The less varied oxygen stable isotope values for cattle compared to domestic caprines might suggest more restricted movement for cattle, which might have spent most of their lives in the settlement in close proximity to humans. They probably received special treatment through fodder provisioning so they could successfully perform their demanding agricultural activities. What is important here is that the preliminary results from isotopic analysis seem to agree with the results from faunal studies and iconography, highlighting the special role of the cow in the Cypriot economy and culture. Uh, and the complete results of this study, which I'm, I'm working on with my colleague uh, Patrick Roberts from the Max Planck Institute in Vienna, are still under uh, process and will hopefully be uh, published soon. Uh, another crucial question also relevant to the cow concerns the physical presence of boss in Dikus or Zipu on the island during prehistoric times. And here I will uh, take a small excursus to explain what Zipu are. Uh, there are too many cattle subspecies uh, in the world. Uh, we have uh, boss torus. Subspecies of cattle was domesticated 10,000 years uh, ago in the Fertile Crescent. Um, this subspecies is better adapted in temperate environments, while Bos indicus or zebu cattle has uh, a characteristic hump and a well pronounced julep. It was domesticated 2,000 years after the domestication of, um, of Bos torus in the Indus Valley in the present day Pakistan. Uh, and this subspecies of cattle is thermotolerant, which means that it can uh, be productive uh, and resilient even in very uh, hot and arid conditions. Looking at the small indigenous cattle population of Cyprus today, we can see that phenotypically, uh, the animals share many similarities with zebu. As you can see from the picture, they have pronouns uh, hams and very well-developed julaps. Uh, two recent high-resolution genetic studies by Flori and Papachristou um, that included samples from Cyprus demonstrated that the island's local cattle population possesses a strong genetic component of Zipu. So when was the admixture between the two cattle subspecies occur on the island and why? 
Uh, a recent genetic study conducted on archaeological cattle samples from Megiddo in the southern Levant show that the genetic admixture between taurine and zebu cattle occurred during the early Iron Age. The author suggested that the crossbreeding between Bostorus and Bos indicus did not occur accidentally, but was most probably the result of deliberate crossbreeding aiming to create a strong and resilient hybrid that could tolerate the so-called climate uh, crisis that has started during the end of the late Bronze Age. Could uh, similar reasons be involved in the introduction of zebu cattle or zebu hybrids on the island of Cyprus? Interestingly, zebu cattle appear in the iconographic corpus of Cyprus during the end of the late Bronze Age in the form of clay and bronze figurines. These figurines have the traits of zipu. They have pronounced hums and very well-developed julaps. And their presence is intriguing, suggesting probably that the local artists were aware of the animal, either because they have seen it somewhere else or because they have observed it in situ on the island shortly after its introduction. <coughs> in order to explore, oh, sorry. In order to explore further this hypothesis, I have started re-examining several uh, cattle bone assemblages dating to the late Bronze Age onwards. We know that osteologically zebu differs from taurine cattle because they have bifid vertebrae uh, to support their heavy hump. However, finding evidence for bifid vertebrae is very difficult because, as I said before, vertebrae have very low uh, structural densities and usually they do not preserve at archaeological sites. What we could do uh, is a DNA studies and extraction of collagen from both postcranial and cranial uh, elements. And of course, collagen preservation is a limitation in Cyprus. Uh, however, we have some positive vibes from a DNA studies. Uh, we have a recent study which was conducted on human remains from the Hellenistic side of uh, Hdima Pafu and provided positive results. So. Um, the only thing, yeah, we have some potentials, and the only thing we can do is to try with a large number of uh, samples. Now, demonstrating the antiquity of Zipu, of Zipu hybrids, and their economic, ecological, and cultural continuum of life on the island of Cyprus will be significant for both archaeology and conservation biology. And such knowledge will lead to the development of new policies, ensuring the preservation of the contemporary native cattle population, which is currently under the threat of extinction, and it will further increase public awareness about this animal. Most importantly, it might help us to overcome future climate crises through the use of their adaptive genetic capacity. And I think that uh, this, um, interaction between zooarchaeology and conservation biology is very important. So this is exactly what the purpose of the zooarchaeology of the future should be. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for, for this. Uh, any questions? Interesting, of course. Have you considered looking at assemblages in the region to look for it? I think that would be very interesting. Yes, okay. yeah, I think Do that would be any? great. There are some studies, uh, as I said, for Megiddo, and then we also have some genetic studies in Egypt. But yeah, so it's present there. Yes, yes. And then there is a database of ancient DNA uh, for cattle. Dan Bradley in Ireland, in the, uh, in the Smurfit Institute of Genetics, is working on creating a big database of cattle, uh, cattle genetic information. So hopefully we will manage to compare our results with their results and locate, characterize our um, cow, Cypriot cow. Something. Were they coexisting? So you have yes, the zebu yes, and, yes, and yes. do we have any idea if they were actually having other landscapes? I mean, uh, they were living in different landscapes, different. Uh, For Cyprus, no, we no. don't have many information. But I think it would be very interesting to look at this, and and another way to. 
to look at the, uh, to separate between the two subspecies is through morphometrics mm -hmm. uh, because zebu cardor are taller and slender. Right. So we could also use morphometrics and see if we have any any kind of difference between different areas yeah. and different regions of or the if, island. If, if you manage to actually differentiate, maybe with isotope analysis, it will be great to see what they were eating and what yeah. kind of, yeah, exactly. of uh, yes. food. So yes. you see different yeah. landscapes. Yeah. We, we know that zebu don't have the requirements that touring cattle have in terms right. of food, so they can live with very low yeah, quality. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes, Chrisam. This is what I was wondering, whether you could see isotopic differences in between the three different kind of species, because you talked about hybrids and then a combination of them, right? Yeah, there is a hybrid. So you have yes. the pure zebu, pure taurine, well, and the hybrid. And I think in Cyprus we have hybrids. Did you see any kind of isotopic differences between them? Uh, you mean osteologically? Osteologically is very difficult, I think, to, to differentiate. No, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I haven't started working on this yet. It's just some ideas about okay. the future, yes. So the, the, the stable isotopes are for touring cattle, so for the early Bronze Age cattle. Uh, we have a question from Carly Enkel. Uh, the question is regarding the difference in caprine and cattle diet in Cyprus. Is this phenomenon observed elsewhere too or unique to Cyprus? If this difference, if you can see this different also in other parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, yeah, uh, well, is this um, only the diet only observed in Cyprus or um, somewhere else? Um, I think, I think in, in Bronze Age Anatolia, they, they found something very similar. They found that cattle had very restricted um, uh, mu much more restricted diets than uh, caprines. So they also proposed that that was a matter of where they, they were keeping the animals and how long they traveled with them. Um, yeah, as far as I know, there are only uh, studies from Bronze Age Anatolia. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> and there is another question mm -hmm. from Filiolu. Sorry for a name. Um, can we distinguish the three subspecies using biometry? Um, yes, so we can distinguish between uh, zebu and taurine from, uh, from the measurements of metacarpals. Uh, and Caroline Grigson has published, um, she has some databases where she has like restricted values for, uh, for Bos torus and Bos indigus. So by using the, um, the metacarpal uh, as a reference, we can, we can separate the two subspecies. But again, it's not the best method. The best and most direct method is through paleogenetics. So we, we can use all these methods together, I think. We can use osteology, paleogenetics, and morphometrics and, and bring them together to, to have a better idea. Yeah. Thank you, Anna, for this really interesting um, talk. It's exciting to see that there's still a lot of research to be done um, if I understand it correctly, the zebu you say is mm -hmm. much more heat and drought resistant. Yes. And but it's mostly a, a beast of burden, a working animal. Yes. Or is it exactly. also for milk and dairy products? Ah, th they produce very little meat, so they produce meat, uh, milk just for the calf. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. So would it be theoretically possible if you have enough? Uh, assemblages to study mm -hmm. to see whether the coexistence of mm -hmm. the taurus mm -hmm. and the zebu actually have different specializations. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting. What would you need for that to, to address such questions mm -hmm. from the excavations, from the field evidence? Yeah. What kind of finds, what kind of... Well, we can look at pathologies. For example, if we have more pathological Excellent. specimens belonging to zebu, they might provide some indirect yeah. evidence that zebu were mostly used for traction and agricultural activities. So pathologies could be a, a way uh, yeah. to look at <coughs> different. 
But the, the milk cows would also do work or they would be mostly producing milk? Well, they can also do work. We know from ethnography that cattle can easily produce milk, work, do agricultural activities. And maybe we can ask Professor Collins later mm -hmm. whether you can, from looking into the um, lipid remains, yes. see which type of, yes. um, of cattle it was. Absolutely. Thank that would you. Be very Thank interesting. you. Thank you. I just wanted to add something to mm -hmm. what Thilo just asked, mm -hmm. that uh, if these animals were used in different activities, mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting to also look into the cross-sectional geometric properties of the metacarpals, metatarsals, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. we have, mm -hmm. because there we would be able to see if there was differential mechanical stress applied sure. in them. Of course, yes. there are too many other body sites yeah. that play a role, the terrain mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. which they move would Absolutely. play a role, but uh, I'm just, I don't think it has been done. No. I think there is a no. study using cross-sectional geometry mm -hmm. in zooarchaeology, but in completely different animals in yes. different settings. Yes, for different purposes. But I do think it's yes. something that has potential yeah, yeah. and has not absolutely. been explored. Absolutely, yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Effie. Uh, has there been much work done on uh, the early assemblages of cattle, of uh, from Shilurok and Bos, let's oh, the say, Neolithic. and the ones found yes. at Kisonerga. And how much can we say uh, needs to be done? And what do we need mm. to do to uh, push this research forward? I know that they've tried to extract some DNA from cattle bones from Shilurok and Bos to see where they are coming from, but it was unsuccessful because collagen preservation from pre-Neolithic sites is really bad. And the same for Kisonerga, Scalia, the preservation is is really bad. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we can uh, really rely on, on later uh, periods, like late Bronze Age onwards, Iron Age, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think the, the early period sites uh, do not preserve bones very well, unfortunately. Let's hope that more excavation brings... Exactly, more. exactly, yes. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, we're going to have a small break until 11.30, until our uh, next speaker.
Uh, hello, everybody. We are back, and uh, we're going to welcome uh, Dr. Ephthymia Nikita, who is going to talk about human osteoarchaeology, fleet and laboratory procedures to minimize data loss. Effie. Hello from me too, and welcome. Thank you for joining us, those of you who are here and those who are watching us remotely. So this presentation is about human osteoarchaeology and how we can extract as much information as possible from relevant studies, both in the field during excavation as well as during the first steps that we take in the lab before the specialists join in. So what we will see here is briefly what is human osteoarchaeology, what is the key information we can extract from relevant studies, how can we minimize data loss in the field and subsequently in the lab? And finally, I will provide you some key online open access resources in case you are interested in more information. So let's start. Human osteoarchaeology is the study of human skeletal remains from archaeological excavations. The human skeleton has approximately 206 bones. I say approximately because there are some tiny bones, ossicles, and their number differs a bit from individual to individual. Now, each bone has a story to tell. Some are more talkative than others, but all of them are important. A key question that we always hear from excavators or the broader public is, how did these people die? Can you tell us the cause of death? And in some cases, as human osteoarchaeologists, we can indeed identify the cause of death. Such an example you see here, this is a skull from the Byzantine site of Christiani, which I examined a few months ago. And what you observe over here is this sharp for stroma to the forehead. Now, this was caused perimortem, as we say, around the time of death. The excavator confirmed to me that this was not done during the excavation, and it is pretty clear because uh, it has various characteristics. One very distinct characteristic is that there is no discoloration, which is what we would have found. Anyway, in this case, we can be pretty certain that this blow to the head is what caused the death of this individual. However, in most cases, when we examine human skeletal remains, what we can say is how these people lived in the past, not how they died. So going back to this trauma to the head, look, in this, look at this. This is a cranium that I studied during my PhD from Libyan Sahara. And what you see here is, again, major sharp force trauma to the head, probably by a sword wound. But it is very, very well healed. You see, there is only a tiny opening here. The rest of it has healed very nicely. So on this occasion, we cannot tell if this blow is what caused the death of the individual due to complications sometime after uh, the trauma was inflicted. It may be the case, or this individual may have died from something completely relevant. In either case, the individual survived this trauma for a long period of time, a sufficient amount of time for all this healing to take place. What can we say, however, based on this evidence, that this individual was a member of a society that cared for its vulnerable members, a society that had some medical knowledge because this didn't just heal on its own. Okay, so this is a case where even an extreme case where we would expect we would be able to identify the cause of death actually gives us information about the living conditions. Now, moving on to something a bit less macabre than blows to the head, the first question we ask when we study human skeletal remains is, what is the sex of this individual? Do we have a female or a male skeleton? In order to address this question, the key anatomical area we examine is the pelvis. What you see here is a male pelvis, and here is a female pelvis. You can all immediately see that the female pelvis is much broader. And I think we all have enough common sense to know why that is the case. So the male pelvis has adapted evolutionarily in order to accommodate bipedal, to facilitate bipedal locomotion. So we can walk long distances on our two feet um, using as little energy as possible. In females, we have obviously the same need evolutionarily, but also we have the um, parturition, the childbirth. Okay, so both these evolutionary pressures need to be accommodated simultaneously in the anatomy of our pelvis. So this is why we observe this difference. Now, when we study skeletal remains, very often the pelvis is fragmented. It is not that well preserved. So we focus on more specific anatomical areas. Most of these characteristics that we study are here in the pubic bone, so in this front part of the pelvis. 
and the three main features we study are the so-called ventral arc, subpubic concavity, and ischiopubic ramus. And this is what they look like in males and females. So you see that in females, here we have this concavity, which in males it is absent. Uh, the ischiopubic ramus in females is more gracile. There is this bony crest here, whereas in males it is more flat and broad. And here in females, we have this bony crest over here that forms kind of a triangle over here, which in males is either absent or really, really subtle. So these are the key traits that we study. Additionally to this, we may examine the so-called greater sciatic knots, which is oh, this part of the pelvis here and here. So if we turn the pubic bones, this is what it looks like. And you can again see very clearly that the female greater sciatic knot is much, much broader than the male one. Here you see the range of variation it may take from typical female to typical male. And this is clearly related to the fact that the female pelvis is broader than the male one. Other characteristics that we examine, are there are multiple traits that we can look into at the pelvis. But for example, I have here the preauricular sulcus. Is this groove over here? Uh, which is present in females, but absent or very, very subtle in males. Okay, so this is here, okay, in case you're wondering in the bigger picture, okay? If the pelvis is not present or if it is completely fragmented, we examine the cranium, the, the skull rather, both the cranium and the mandible. Now, contrary to the pelvis, where the differences that we observe between males and females are evolutionarily controlled, in the cranium, the differences we find between sexes are due to the fact that males in general are more robust, and more muscular than women, than females. As you understand, however, this is very um, relative. Different populations in different time periods exhibit different levels of robusticity, depending on their daily facilities, on the food they consume, and what are the masticatory uh, you know, pressures in the cranium, and the, the climate also affects cranial shape, and many, many other factors. So we always examine the cranium secondarily to the pelvis, and always with some caution. The areas, the specific anatomical areas on the cranium that we study uh, are usually places where we have muscle attachments. So as I said, men tend to be more muscular than women. So these are areas that are also more robust. We have more bone formation there. So one such area is the glabella, it's this part here, so between your eyebrows. Another area is the mastoid process behind your ear. And another area is the nuchal crest at the back of your head over here. So in all cases, in males, these areas are more developed, better developed than in females, because we are more gracile. So the mandible is also useful in sex estimation. Uh, two of the characteristics we examine are the shape of the jaw, which, as we all know, is more rectangular in males and more round in females. Uh, or there is also the ascending ramus over here, which in males exhibit a certain concavity, as you see here, uh, whereas in females it's very subtle or even absent. Now, once we have assessed if this skeleton is male or female, the second question is how old was this individual at the time of death? We have different methods, obviously, for juveniles, for sub-adults, and for adults. In uh, juveniles, we examine the maturity of the skeleton, and we focus both on the teeth, the stage of development and eruption of the dentition. This is the, actually the, the key method we use. Uh, as you must all remember, we have two sets of teeth. We have the baby teeth, the deciduous teeth, as we call them, and these are gradually replaced by the permanent teeth, the teeth that we have then for the rest of our lives. So when we have a jaw, the jaw of a child, we can examine at what stage the diff of formation the different teeth are, and then we compare that to atlases like the one you see here, the so-called London Atlas, which has been developed using modern children uh, of known age. So then we see where our specimen fall, uh, falls in this sequence. Alternatively, we may take measurements of the bones, especially long bone lengths, and compare this with growth charts, again, based on modern standards of modern children, which has its limitations, but it is the best we have. And finally, we may examine the stage of maturity of the skeleton. So what you see here is a proximal femur. It is this thigh bone. And this area is the upper part of the thigh bone, where it uh, articulates with the pelvis. So if you notice here and here, 
it appears as if the bone is broken, it's fractured. But in reality, what you see is a bone that is still fusing, it is still coming together. So I mentioned at the beginning that the human skeleton consists of 206 bones. However, when we are born, the skeleton actually consists of 270 bones. Because much of our skeleton, much of our skeletal elements, many of our skeletal elements, consist of sub-elements, which gradually fuse together to give rise to the final mature bone. So once again, by checking out how far along we are along this process of fusing of the different sub-elements of each bone, we can tell the age of the individual. Now, for adults, things are different. Now, skeletal maturity is done, the growth of the skeleton is done, so it's all downhill from now on. We study the degeneration of the skeleton. So we examine different joints of the human skeleton and see how badly damaged they are. One of the key joints we examine is the pubic symphysis. So once again, the same anatomical area as I showed you before for sexing, so over here. Uh, and this is what it looks like in different uh, ages. So over here, we have a very young individual around 17, 18 years old. And you see that there is this wavy uh, surface. Gradually, the waviness goes away. We have this rim forming perimetrically. Okay, you see it here fully formed. And then in older individuals, it's, you can clearly see the degeneration that has happened there in the pelvis. Now, before proceeding, I should stress that in adults, age estimation is problematic in many ways, and the key reason that it is problematic is that the degeneration of the skeleton is controlled by many, many factors uh, beyond the chronological age of an individual. So, depending on how active we are, uh, our diet, any underlying pathologies, these, these stages may be reached sooner or later by an individual. Okay. Now, another joint that we examine, it's not as accurate, but we still use it, is the sternal rib bend. So these are our ribs. They connect to the sternum over here via cartilage. This is the cartilage, so this has disintegrated post-mortem. But by examining this surface over here, the rib surface where it connects to the cartilage, and then via that through the sternum, this is what we see. Again, a gradual degeneration of that joint with uh, new bone formation, ossification of the cartilage, the deepening of the central surface, and so on. Okay, it doesn't look very nice, but it is what it is. So this is how we estimate age. The next question we try to address is metric variation. How tall were these people? And also, and very importantly, what can we tell about their growth patterns? So, stature is interesting in the sense that it gives us an idea of what people looked like in the past, but it is even more interesting because it gives us an idea of the life quality of these people. So, if an individual is malnourished during his childhood or goes through some serious episodes of disease, so if this individual goes through some serious physiological stress, as we call it, his stature will be lower than expected and his growth will be retarded. Okay, having said that, so this individual, we say, uh, will not reach his or her uh, genetic potential in terms of reaching the stature that he could have reached. Okay, we should always remember that, you know, in some individuals there is not much genetic potential to begin with, okay? So a short individual doesn't imply a malnourished individual. But by com if we have big sample sizes, it is very interesting to compare stature within groups and between groups and in different time periods, and then we can really see pat and how these correlate with pathologies and isotope studies for diet, etc. And there we can really start seeing patterns uh, of growth stunting or not. So how do we estimate stature? There are two approaches. The basic approach and the most widely used one is so-called mathematical methods. So here we measure the maximum length, preferably of the long bones, so the femur, tibia, humerus, ulna radius, any of the long bones, preferably the femur. If you have one bone to select, that should be the femur. Uh, and then once we have the long bone maximum length, we use so-called regression equations, like this here, where we input the stature, uh, the, sorry, the long bone length, and we estimate the stature. These equations have been designed mostly using modern populations where we know the correlation between long bone length and stature. Okay. 
The other method is so-called anatomical approaches, anatomical methods, and here it's much more detailed. We basically measure the height of every single skeletal element that contributes to our stature. So the articulated talus and calcaneus, the foot bones here, then the tibia, the femur, uh, the sacrum to represent the pelvis, then all the vertebrae, and finally the cranium. We add a correction factor for the soft tissues that are no longer there, and here is the stature. As you can all imagine, this method is quite problematic with archaeological remains because it requires a very, very good preservation of pretty much the entire skeleton. But if it is available, I mean, we should definitely go for that. So we've talked already about age, sex, and metric variation. Through the human skeleton, the study of the human skeleton, we can draw some conclusions regarding the activity patterns of past populations. I should stress that this is one of the most problematic aspects of human osteoarchaeological analysis. It has been deemed the holy grail of osteoarchaeology. Uh, none of the available methods is you know, super accurate, but I will present to you uh, two methods that are rather commonly used in the literature. So the first one, the most commonly adopted, is the study of so-called enthesial changes. The emphases are the sites on the skeleton where the muscles attach. Now, because uh, here you can see the emphasis of the humerus, okay, all these uh, colored parts. Because the skeleton is a living tissue, it responds to mechanical stress either by creating new bone or resorbing, absorbing existing bone. So when our muscles pull the bone surface, when we uh, perform repeated, repeated activities, the skeleton will react in the ways I just described. So we see something like that on the sides of the emphasis. New bone formation, these osteophytes here, macroporosity, uh, microporosity, smaller pores, and other changes. These changes can either be recorded uh, macroscopically, visually, or here in the, uh, other scholars have used 3D scanning. And here in the Cyprus Institute, we used a 3D surface microscopy to quantify them, to get a number to express them. A very serious limitation of enthesial changes is that their expression is very largely controlled by the age of an individual. So older individuals will exhibit such changes simply because they are older, not necessarily because they have been more active during their lifetime. And there are also other factors, such as the body size of an individual, bigger individuals will have more pronounced changes again, not necessarily because they were more active, and many other factors. Having said that, very recent experimental studies have reaffirmed the validity of uh, the, the utility of enthesial changes as activity markers. So it is still a topic very hot and open to debate, but we still see many, many papers using them as activity markers. Another method that we use to deduce past activities is the study of the human teeth. What you see here is a typical pattern of dental wear in molars and premolars. So this white layer is the enamel, it is the outer layer of the teeth, the hardest layer. Oops, sorry, here. What you see here, these little islands, are the dentin, the inside, the second uh, layer, let's say, the internal layer uh, in any tooth. So typically in archaeological populations, we do find a lot of dental wear. So what you see here is that the cusps of the teeth have been eliminated. They are flat, all of them. And in this case here, uh, the dental wear is so pronounced that even the dentin has been reached. This is very, very common in archaeological populations, I repeat. And it gives us an idea of um, the hard consistency of the food or how processed the food was. Um, if there were inclusions in the food that had not been effectively removed and so on. What is very interesting in terms of activity reconstruction is something like that. When we have cases of very distinct patterned dental wear, so what you see here is a mandible, the lower jaw, the anterior teeth, the front teeth, and you can see that there's a very, very distinct type of dental wear here. That was not alimentary, that was not the result of diet. That happened because these people used their teeth in order to process whatever, fibers, ropes, basketry, leather, I have no idea. Okay, and here we see some modern ethnographic examples from the Hadza in Africa. Various diseases can affect the human skeleton, and these may have all sorts of etiologies. So we have dental diseases like dental caries, dental plaque, which once it mineralizes, we call it dental calculus, and you will hear all about it after lunch, all the information we can extract from this deposit. 
these little grooves here, these horizontal grooves, are called linear enamel hypoplasia. Each of these represents a stressful episode in the lifetime of the individual. So when you have, again, malnutrition or some serious disease, while the teeth were still forming, their formation will be problematic, like you see here. And this is what I said before when I said it's interesting to examine the growth pattern studies. For, it would be interesting to associate them, for instance, with such markers of stress. Uh, here you see a periapical cavity, maybe an abscess or something like that. Uh, arthritis, knee arthritis in this case, osteomyelitis, so inflammation of the medullary cavity. Uh, this here, this depression here in the center of the vertebral body is called the Smalls node, and it is an indication of mechanical stress in the spine. There are other potential etiologies, but this is uh, one of the most prevalent ones. And many other pathologies can affect the human skeleton, neoplasms, congenital disorders, metabolic diseases, all sorts. So, now that we have a very brief idea of the kind of information we can extract from the human skeleton, Let's see what we can do at a very basic level to minimize data loss. So I mentioned earlier that the human pelvis is a key area both for assessing sex and age. However, the human pelvis has a serious limitation, and this is preservation. The human skeleton consists of two types of tissue, which you can see very clearly here. We have trabecular bone, which is this honeycomb structured bone, and cortical or compact bone, you can see it here, which by definition has a more compact um, consistency. Now, post-mortem, once the individual has been buried and all sorts of taphonomic processes start acting on the skeleton, trabecular bone is a lot more vulnerable to these processes and it tends to disintegrate very easily, whereas compact bone will preserve normally better for longer periods of time. What is happening with the pelvis? The pelvis consists largely of trabecular bone. So this means that very often when you excavate the skeleton, the pelvis will be there. It may be fragmented, but it will be there largely. But the moment you lift it, it will just fall apart. So what can we do? It would be extremely useful for us, extreme, yeah, <laughs> extremely useful, if during excavation, before lifting the pelvis, you could take photographs from this area here, the pubic symphysis area, both for age and for sex. Just take photos from different angles and then we will sort it out. Secondarily, if you can, please also take some photographs from the sciatic knots, the greater sciatic knots. This area usually preserves better than the pubic symphysis, but if you are at it and you have the camera, take some photos of the greater sciatic knots as well, please. Remember, it is useful for sexing. Now, regarding uh, uh, and as I said also, sorry, the pubic symphysis is also useful for, uh, for age estimation. So this is one extra reason why we need the photographs from this area. Now, going on with age uh, at death estimation, a big problem we have is with juvenile remains and especially with infants and very young children. And this is because their bones are not easy to distinguish, to identify. So what you see here is a mature, like a fully formed uh, humerus, so this bone over here. What you see here is what this bone looks like in perinates, so in uh, individuals that are just about to be born or have just been born, and this is an actual scale. Okay, so we don't expect anyone, any non-specialist, to identify that this is a humerus, obviously, but even bones that don't look human, uh, please collect them, because it has happened to me in the past that people assume that they were rodents and they were a uh, lot of uh, contamination at a later stage and didn't bother with them. So even if they don't look human, please collect everything and you know, make it our problem in the lab. We will sort it. And the issue becomes even clearer once you see what the epiphyses look like, so what the extremities of the bones look like. This is what the head of the humerus, so this part here, looks like in a three-year-old. Here you can see what it looks like in an eight-year-old, and here it is fully developed now. Okay, so what I find very often is that the excavators have collected the diaphysis, so this tubular part, but hardly any of the epiphyses. And I understand that because in the soil, this just look like little lumps of soil very often. Okay, so. Uh, we respect that and we do understand that excavations often happen in really unfavorable conditions and in a hurry and there is no room to sieve everything. But especially when you have baby burials, 
please either sieve or at least collect all the soil and then we will sort it out in the lab, whatever is easier and uh, best for you. Um, another thing, ah, and especially be careful when you're excavating adult skeletons, if you find any small bones in the pelvic area, very often these bones are fetal bones, obviously. Now, very, very important. Teeth are a key source of information. As we have seen, they are used in age at death estimation, when, especially when we have uh, juvenile skeletons. They are used in pathological assessments, in activity reconstruction, and as we will see later on, in biochemical analysis. At the same time, teeth are very easy to lose. What you see here is a case of antemortem tooth loss. So this individual pathologically lost his posterior teeth. And we can tell that this happened some years before the individual's death because the sockets, the tooth sockets, have been completely resorbed. There is all this new bone filling these tooth sockets. So there is nothing for us to do in this case. The teeth were lost at some point long before he or she was deposited for burial. But in this case here, these three bones must have been present at the time of the death of the individual. Okay, you see the tooth sockets are there very, very clearly. So in this case, the teeth fell off the, um, the jaw at some point after the burial of the individual, simply because the soft tissues that kept them in place disintegrated, so there was nothing holding them there anymore. So what I would suggest in this case is once again, if possible, to sieve the soil at least around the cranial area if not possible, lift the cranium and block and let us clean it and do the sieving in the lab. That's it, if it's not too much trouble. Now, with regard to metrics analysis, I already explained growth patterns and stature estimation. So when you have a skeleton, the problem we have with the long bones is that the epiphysis, the two extremities of the bone, consist of trabecular bone, as we saw in the cross-section as well of the femur that I showed you, which means that very often when you have a burial, the long bone, the femur, let's say, will be there, but then once you lift it, the central part, the diaphysis, the tubular part, will more or less preserve, maybe fragmented, but we can reconstruct it, but the two extremities, the epiphysis, as we call them, will fall apart, and this will not be reconstructible in the lab. So if possible, please, with a measuring tape, no fancy equipment, take a measurement of the maximum length, preferably of the femur. So if you only have time for one measurement, go for the femur. If you have time for more, all the long bones would be ideal to have, if possible. Now, what else? Ah, yes. I spoke earlier about uh, sex estimation and I presented to you a number of morphological traits that we examine in the cranium and the pelvis. Additionally to those, we may use various metric methods. So we take measurements from the skeleton, all over the skeleton, and we compare the dimensions between males and females. Because as we said, on average, males tend to be bigger than females. Of course, with a lot of variability. Now, three key measurements that we use, like in the simplest form of this metric sex estimation, is the diameter of the head of the femur, as you see here, the humerus, and the radius. As I have repeatedly stressed, these are areas that tend to disintegrate post-mortem because they consist of trabecular bone. So if during the excavation they are still there or approximately there, it would be tremendously helpful if you could take one at least of these measurements per skeleton, so that we can estimate the sex of this individual. <coughs> now, a few very brief words regarding curation. Once the skeletons have been excavated, they are moved to the lab, and from that point onwards, it is the osteoarchaeologist's uh, business to, you know, duty to deal with them. However, if you're going to store human bones for long periods of time before they can actually be studied, it is advisable to remove excessive soil from them because if the soil is moist, it will create mold sooner or later. If it is very dry, it is going to cause cracks to the bones. How do we remove soil? We are as non-invasive as possible. We do not wash the bones unless they have come out of very clay soil, so there is no other way. But other than that, we do some dry brassing with soft brasses, some wooden implements. We avoid metal tools because they do scratch the surfaces a lot. 
Now, I have two cases here, like where, when the soil is more persistent, we may use some chemicals, and if it is really, really uh, persistent, a hard crust, we may use mechanical cleaning. Having said that, if you have any of these two cases, I would just suggest you let the uh, bones with the soil matrix dry really, really, really well, and then store them, and the osteologist will do these two steps here. Okay, so just please do the dry brassing and some basic cleaning with stone tools if there is no osteologist available to deal with that uh, soon. Finally, make sure to sieve any soil that you remove during cleaning. We find beads, coins, uh, small bones. We, we found all sorts of things in there. Uh, regarding long-term storage now, I already mentioned the importance of uh, drying the bones very well. You don't need any fancy equipment for that. This is what we did when I was at the Fitz lab in the Brit... Oops, oops, no, sorry. Okay, no. Uh, this is what I did when I was at the Fitz lab at the British School at Athens. We just used the, an old camp bed. I bought a metal sieve, which is very cheap, by the meter. We put it on top, and then we would just put the bones there to dry. It is important not to expose them to direct sunlight, because it will cause cracks, or have them under an air condition, or anything invasive like that. Just let them dry naturally, even if it takes longer. Uh, I stressed repeatedly the importance of dry bones. These are some cases where mold developed. Uh, and it is important to remember something that, you know, I unfortunately learned from experience, that sometimes they appear dry on the outside, but they have retained a lot of moisture inside. So give them their time. Uh, finally, regarding uh, humidity and temperature, these are the um, standards recommended for museums that I have found in different resources online. So 35 to 70 percent humidity and 10 to 25 degrees Celsius. As a general rule of thumb, just avoid extremes. Okay, I don't know how easy it is to monitor uh, these parameters realistically, and in terms of space availability and all that, I think we all appreciate that uh, the resources are limited, but please make sure to avoid extremes of humidity and uh, heat cold. That's it. And finally, some very, very, uh, just a few words regarding sampling strategies only to highlight which skeletal tissues are uh, usually targeted for a relevant analysis. Okay? So, for carbon and nitrogen stable isotope analysis, which we use in order to reconstruct past diets, we usually sample the long bone shaft, so the diaphysis, the central tubular part, the cortical bone, uh, the ribs, and then we may also sample two dental tissues, the enamel and the dentin, so this outer layer and maybe this inner layer. Then for strontium and oxygen isotope analysis, which we use to uh, study past mobility patterns, we sample the enamel for strontium, uh, the enamel and some bone tissue, femur or ribs for oxygen isotope analysis. Now, a common strategy is to sample different tissues of the skeleton because different parts of the skeleton form at different stages in an individual's lifetime. And also, the human skeleton has the capacity to, sort of speak, recycle itself. So our bones keep being remodeled, as we call it. And the different bones remodel at different rates. So by sampling different parts of the skeleton, we can capture changes in diet and mobility at different stages in an individual's lifetime. Finally, for uh, C14 dating, we sample the femur, tibia, humerus, or mandible, just a part, uh, small piece of cortical bone. So, so far we see that these three methods largely focus in the same areas. Enamel, maybe dentin, and some cortical bone fragment, preferably from the femur. For ancient DNA, the picture is very different. Traditionally, we sampled the dentin, so I repeat, it's this tissue in here. More recently, uh, researchers started sampling the cementum, which is this tissue here that covers the root of the teeth. But then nowadays, the most uh, popular approach that yields the best results is the petrous part of the temporal bone. The temporal bone is this over here. You see it here magnified, it's over here where your ear is. And if we flip it, this is the inside, from inside of the cranium. And this part here, the red area, is called the petrous part, and this is what gives the best ancient DNA results. 
I know. I don't even know why they thought to target that in the first place. Good for them. Um, and a very recent paper actually found that the ER ossicle, so inside our ER canal, there are three tiny bones that you see here. And these three give almost as good results as the petrous part of um, the temporal bone. And it's actually less invasive to target this because if you shake the cranium, oops, they fall off. Whereas with the petrous part, you need to drill from the base of the cranium in order to access it. So it is more invasive and destructive. Unless, of course, the cranium is already in pieces, in which case you can access it a lot more easily and less invasively. So there are some perks in partially preserved skeletal remains. Now, uh, I said earlier that we will close with some open access resources that you can uh, find where you can find more information. So there are various guides online if you just Google them. And I should flag these two, which were produced by members of Star C in the context of the Promised project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Effie, for this very informative uh, talk. Questions? Question on on-site documentation. So um, one of the problems when we don't have time is actually drawing a, a very uh, precise, say, uh, drawing of the actual skeleton. How, uh, um, because we have photogrammetry recently, how do you find that kind of documentation? Is it accurate for you? Does it help? Uh, Personally, I have found photogrammetry very, very useful. And then what we do sometimes is we, we make the drawing using the um, photographs of the tomb, if necessary. But for me, at least, photogrammetry is uh, very sufficient. Uh, I, I would like to, to ask something. Effie, how, how, how important do you think it is, especially when we're, uh, we're having commingled remains, mm -hmm. for a human osteoarchaeologist to be on site for the interpretation, for the recording of the interpretation of the, of the material. How, how do you feel about it? I would say that in cases like that, where we have commingled mixed deposits, it is practically Im imperative to have an anthropologist present, if possible. Because uh, ev everything is complicated uh, there, and the whole taphonomic process needs to be reconstructed. So even for an anthropologist, it is very difficult to understand what is going on. So let alone if you're not even present when the excavation takes place, no matter how well documented it is. So and now an example that I can bring from Cyprus is that um, we are involved in the excavation of some sarcophagi with Anna Carligiotti, who is here from ancient Kition. We were kindly invited by the excavator, Polina Christophe, and with the permission of the Department of Antiquities. So even though we have a closed context there, it's sarcophagi. So they have, what, four or five individuals maximum, Anna, we have? Maximum, we have. Okay, there you go. <laughs> but they're not complete. They're not necessarily seven to nine complete. No, 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 not complete. Okay, so even in such a closed, very small context, uh, we see that it is very, very difficult to disentangle exactly what happened and the different episodes, even though we are conducting the excavation. So let alone if you have a big fall of tomb, for example, like the Messina yeah, Messin and the Crete and all sorts of places. Yeah, in that case. Good luck, yes. <laughs> Good luck to everyone. No, there, there, there are a lot of studies that they have done that now. But uh, uh, am I right to, to, to suggest a two millimeter sieve uh, for, 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 uh, to sieve the soil because it catches even the, the small uh, teeth? Yes, we, like yes. and sometimes we do a thing where we combine different yeah. sieves, uh, bigger and then smaller and then smaller, and see what falls in different... Uh, but two millimeters, two millimeters is, uh, is, yes. is more than sufficient. Yes, you will get pretty much everything we need, realistically. Have yeah, we have a question from Katrina Grigorjeva, um, which asks, um, how long do you have to wait uh, at the bone dry before uh, putting them in plastic bags? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> and naturally, it depends a lot on the conditions. So, what is the relative humidity where you have the bones drying? Uh, if they are, you know, if there is wind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In my experience, on average, it is between, uh, it is three to five days where I have worked. So it is, and I appreciate, and I have to say here, okay, we give these guidelines. But realistically, I have found myself in situations where we were doing field work. In Africa, we were there only for three weeks. During these three weeks, they had to be cleaned, studied, stored, etc. So 
I have to, you know, I have to say that I, I also put them out in the sunlight after some point because there just would not be, and we didn't know if we could go back next season to study them. So these are the ideal guidelines. In reality, unfortunately, we have all violated them to some extent, hopefully to a small extent. Um, but yes, in my experience, when you do it properly and you don't expose them to sunlight, etc., I have found where I have worked it takes three to five days. Yes. One more question, Effie. What can we still learn from the traditional measurements of skull shape and so on? Um, is that still current or is that no longer? Of course, it, it's always current. Craniometry is always current. So with craniometry, we basically do two things at the moment in anthropology. The first one is the sex estimation. We can tell if a skeleton belongs to a male or a female. Uh, so the morphological differences I showed to you, coupled with the fact that males are bigger on average than females, can separate the two sexes using measurements of the cranium. And secondarily, we use cranial measurements in biodistance studies. So the shape of the human cranium uh, differs in uh, individuals of different ancestry or individuals who have adapted in different environments. So even though nowadays anthropology fully acknowledges that these racial concepts of uh, the 1800s are completely outdated and meaningless, there is no question that people who have different ancestry, who have been um, raised generation after generation, in diff who have adapted in different natural environments, differ in their physical characteristics, and this is reflected in the shape of the cranium. So by measuring crania and applying different types of statistical analysis, we can see how people group together or are differentiated. That's it. That's what comes to mind. Thank you, Effie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, four minutes until uh, Professor Collins is uh, going to be online. So well, you have four minutes.
my name is Matthew Collins uh, from University of Cambridge and Copenhagen. And uh, I want to talk to you today about integrated, what's this, Tilo. I have a, you have a question for me about Indian and Taurine milk. Okay, I'd better answer that one first before I move on. So yeah, good question. Unfortunately, the answers we probably can't. This is the most recent paper that I've been able to find. And in this paper, they're actually exploring um, milk proteins in dental calculus. And here they were able to find the presence of cattle milk. However, when you actually look at the sequence, what they find is this tiny piece of the cattle milk sequence. And unfortunately, if you look at all the different species of cattle, there are no differences between them. Um, and in fact, my student, Barat Nair, is, in, is investigating this. That one sequence in milk proteins is part of a much larger sequence for one particular um, milk protein called beta-lactoglobulin. And the interesting thing that he's focusing on there is whether or not why this peptide survives and the other peptides don't. And you can see it's the most acidic. If you look at the PI, the, the, the isoelectric point, you'll see that this is the most acidic part of the protein. Um, but he also notices that the differences between cow, sheep, and goat, which are where the differences are, so we can't tell Indian from taurine cattle, are actually in one residue. And he suspects that these more acidic proteins in the cow actually may bind more strongly within the matrix and survive better. So he's currently asking the question, actually, could the milk proteins of cow's milk be more predominant simply because of diagenesis? So yeah, Indian taurine cattle, Tilo, I don't think we can tell them apart with proteins, sadly. Let's get back to the talk. Right, so this is a talk on integrating biomolecular analysis. And this is something that I've thought about and cared about a lot for a long time. This, believe it or not, this horrible slide, is a slide that I used when I was trying to pre present a business case to the University of York to set up a thing called BioArc. And believe it or not, they believed in this idea. We were supposed to be taking from ancient samples a range of different materials and by integrating biology, archaeology and chemistry, we wanted to provide a much more holistic picture. And luckily, despite how bad the slide was, they funded the work and BioArc was established. And in BioArc, we have been trying to do this to integrate those analyses together. But I was still disappointed um, and when we look back to think about the work of the great David Clark from Cambridge and the way in which we really are trying to drag out of bad samples and indirect traces, good information about our human past. And then actually when we go right back into 1956 in the UN Declaration saying that we should be applying scientific methods in an effective way using the latest advances we then have to be conscious of the fact that these are often rare and valuable resources. And so in 2017, with the help from the Max Planck Society, the British Museum, the Wellcome Trust, and the, the Danish Natural Research Foundation that fund me in Copenhagen, we had a workshop, um, a day-long workshop at Wellcome Trust talking about sampling and biomolecular archaeology and integrated analysis. And the thing that really impressed me about that meeting was a presentation from the National Gallery. And the reason for that was because, of course, in archaeology, often the research scientists who are involved in projects will go to a museum, they'll talk to field archaeologists, and they'll say, can I have some samples? I don't need very much. Just a few grams will do. But in the case of the National Gallery, of course, when they're given access to valuable works of art, they're only given tiny, small fragments of material. And these materials are very complex. They're multi-layered. They're made of organic and inorganic materials. And I think in archaeology, we actually can learn a lot from the challenges that the historical scientists working in, in, in particularly art history have been faced with. And the slide that impressed me the most from them was this particular slide, where they explored all the different things that they will consider once they have on those tiny plugs or fragments of paint. And so that got me thinking. And so I want to tell you a story, 
not a particularly great story about how I tried to do this on a study with Dan Bradley, who we've already talked, we've heard about, and Rui Martiania. And Rui had developed a technique for capturing Y chromosomes from human remains. This was about 2016. And Dan spoke to me about the idea of could we find a site in which we could find humans which were local and non-local. And so what I wanted to do is actually to bring together all of the researchers around the problem. And I was able over two days to bring together the, the, the original field archaeologists, the leaders of the team, the osteoarchaeologists, some, some funerary specialists in Roman burial practice, and the isotope geochemist, the protein researchers, and the DNA researchers. And on the first day, we all explained our techniques. And on the second day, we looked at the data. And it was a site here in York, very famous site. Uh, it's been made the basis of the TV documentary. And the reason for that is because these individuals, most of them are male, and most of them had lost their heads. And what we did is previous work had conducted strontium and oxygen isotope analysis on their teeth and had noticed that one of the individuals, this one here, was um, so extreme in its oxygen uh, isotope analysis that it was probably coming from a much warmer place than the average from Britain. And so we assumed that perhaps when this set of skeletons, which were thought to be maybe gladiators, this individual was from outside of the Yorkshire environment and may have been a foreigner. And if you're looking then at Y chromosomes, we could then look at an atypical Y chromosome. Between discussion of the samples, getting the samples together and the workshop going ahead, there was then a very large um, a, a improvement in DNA technologies. And so we decided actually, rather than sequencing the Y chromosome, we'd sequence everything. And this actually became the first set of complete human genomes, ancient human geno genomes from Britain. And when we had done this and we analyzed those samples, we were kind of surprised. This individual was like all the other individuals. When it was plotted on one of these terrible principal components analyses, it sat in this area here, this green area here of Northwest Europe and Britain. And um, quite unlike a foreigner. It was a local individual. So even though its isotopes were different, it was a local individual. Luckily, as part of that study, we had actually analyzed um, an extra sample which hadn't been analyzed for isotopes. And when we analyzed it for isotopes, it looked extremely different indeed. And when we analyzed the genetics of this individual, it was also extremely different. But this comes to me to what I would call the teapot problem. We had got together archaeologists, osteoarchaeologists, geneticists, protein specialists, isot isotope specialists. But when we all present our data, we present our data in a way which is the most meaningful, we feel, to everyone at the meeting. And I challenge you, maybe you can do it now, but probably you haven't got enough time. Just Google images of teapots and see what you see. Well, I've done it for you. Here are some images of teapots. Teapots are three-dimensional objects. The images sit in two dimensions. And it's really striking that here I'm, I'm, I'm Googling Yijing teapots, that almost every single image is taken from the same position. This is basically principal components analysis. It's taking a large amount of data from multi-dimensions, here three, and compressing it down to two, but to show the maximum differences. And one of the things about integrated analysis is in my view, we have to have the archaeologists driving the question and not the scientists. So if we actually ask the question, the question could be about the fact that if we go to the Roman wall, Hadrian's wall, we see there's a legion that actually came out of present-day Syria, Palestine. 
actually, when we look at the DNA, we do in fact have one individual from that region, the one with the very unusual isotopes. But the question shouldn't have been, what do the genetics tell us? It should have been questions about the mobility, the accessibility, and we should be integrating the genetics in with a much wider sweep of archaeological data. And so for the teapot problem, it's not asking the question, what does a Yingxing teapot look like? But asking the question, who has made this particular teapot? The most important bit of information you couldn't see in that image, it was on the bottom. It was the maker's mark. So thinking now about where we move forward with integrated analysis, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is something that's been happening here in Denmark over the last few days, last few months. And this is part of a much wider initiative which involves Cyprus, um, as you can see here which is a large European research infrastructure in heritage science. But if you look at the map, Scandinavia is wholly missing. We're not colored on the map. The map is coordinated in Italy, which is shown in the bright pink, but there's just nothing in Scandinavia. And so the course of the last six months, we've been working with the Ministry of Higher Education and Science in Denmark to put heritage science onto the Danish roadmap in a, with a view to a much more integrated view of archaeological science. And what this means is that we can work on a European scale, so we can work between researchers in, in the Mediterranean, in, in Scandinavia, in, in Spain, and, and, and in Germany. And the timeline of this is we are currently in a development phase called IPIR and HS, and there's going to be opportunities for those who are interested to work with the IPIR and team, but ultimately IRIS, this major research infrastructure, should start in about uh, 2024, 20, 25. And Denmark, my little part, has just been added on at the very beginning of 2020, so we're now on, able to sort of be part of this. And we are waiting to find out whether or not we'll be part of the Danish roadmap so we can actually join in the larger sense. But why do we want to join that roadmap? Because what we're building in Copenhagen here is a large team of scientists who all care about integrated analysis. And they're all working on it from different positions. And I've been very lucky enough to be, to be funded on, on a series of grants with these individuals to really start to build together a team of specialists in areas such as lipids, Ionarisus diaga, paleoproteomics, Frida Welker, paleogenetics, Christine Caro, um, and then a whole team of other researchers who are working on actually applying those uh, to a range of different research questions. And so we're working on all kinds of strange and wonderful things. Birch bark, tar, beer, beeswax, brains and parchment. And you may have seen the work that was done on the birch bark tar, where it was, we were able from Danish birch bark, bark tar to actually extract the DNA and, 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 and construct uh, this young girl that we call Alola because she comes from Lolland in, in southern Denmark. And so what we're now trying to do is to think about how as scientists, once we have the samples, that we can begin to develop uh, integrated extraction protocols where we mean that we can sort of pull out the proteins, the DNA and the lipids from very small sample sets and then ally that with other techniques such as uh, microfossils, as you're going to hear from Anita Adina this afternoon, and some of the isotope work that you've already heard about this morning. And so, what I would say then is, um, to what extent is it better that we bring all of these techniques together? So this is kind of the way I would like to think about something in the future, and the way in which I hope with something like ERIS and the, the opportunity for archaeologists and researchers to work across the European scale, working in different laboratories, and as part of ERIS, you will be able to apply to spend time in another lab and then learn another method. That we can select samples in the field with the archaeologists, they can be driving this research. And then we can do things like imaging initially to ensure that we don't lose any information. 
we can scream for the optimal samples. We've already heard so many times today about the challenges we have in places like Cyprus with good preservation of collagen and good preservation of DNA. And then how we go about demineralizing that sample. And of course, when you demineralize, you've got an, an isotopic inorganic fraction, which very often we just throw down the sink. And then you've got an organic fraction, which is much more complex. It contains proteins, DNA, lipids, and I've been learning over the last few days, metabolomics, um, that we can begin to integrate. And then we can look even within those at things like proteins at the individual constituent amino acids. And one of the things I'm really excited about is can, for instance, we look at the age at death of individuals by looking at things like amino acid racemization and protein decay in tooth enamel. So it's not just the proteomics, it's looking, it's digging deeper in every case. And, and then ultimately, and this is the thing that one of the biggest challenges that we all have, how do I see then integrate all that information back together again? And I don't want the situation again that I had in the case of the work uh, of the Romans from York, which is where you kind of post hoc bring everyone back together. And then you've learned, you've, taken the wrong samples and answered the wrong question. And so one of the things I think we should be thinking about moving forward, and this is a very nice example from the workers in lipids, and I'm not a lipid chemist. This is a, a, a publication produced primarily by Richard Evershed and his team at Bristol with Oliver Craig from the University of York and Carl Herr and others, is actually some, some simple guidance, which this is online, it can be downloaded, which explains the basic principles behind the techniques and allows you to see the limitations and scope of particular methods. And I hope that's something that moving forward we can do for all, we can populate the whole of this figure. Um, and then another thing, I'm now sitting in Cambridge as chair of the Duckworth Committee. So this is one of the larger collections of human remains in the UK. And I think many of you are aware of, have heard, or have been exposed to uh, the last decade of scientists, archaeological scientists, going to museum collections, going to talk to archaeologists and demanding samples, or not demanding, but requesting that they share samples, um, but essentially collecting large amounts of material, doing the analysis, often in isolation, and then only bringing the archaeologists back in right at the end when the paper is being written. And if you now look to the policies of major museums like the British Museum and, and the Duckworth Collection, you know, we're really conscious that we have samples which have been some, you know, bones, individuals which have been sampled multiple times. And of course, once a study is reported, um, people want to study the same collection again. So certain collections which are easily accessible and widely documented will be hit again and again and again. So we really need to be careful, I think, about the way in which we analyze these samples and think about the value to them. And if you look at the guidance online from the, 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 the British Museum, you'll see the way in which they're now assessing uh, sample destructive analysis. And one of the things we're kind of thinking more about, we haven't yet formally this yet, but I think more about it in the Duckworth is how we can make sure that if one individual is going to sample skeletal material, can it be shared with others? Can it be integrated? And so I think we need much more of this dialectic between the researchers and, 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 and curators. We need to think about why we're we sampling, what are we sampling, and not only just in terms of the scientific value, but also the public outreach. Of course, we have to think about colonialism, where are we taking the samples from? And, and, and of course, I think one of the real problems in the past, in the recent present, in fact, is the fact that most of the major labs, such as the lab in Copenhagen, which are extremely well resourced, um, are in restricted, very wealthy parts of the world. And there's been a tendency for samples to travel to those labs and for those labs to then uh, integrate the analysis. And I think then, there's, a, there's huge challenges with the way that we get documented, documentation of the work, 
about sampling and destructive sampling. We've heard in the last presentation about the importance of Petrus. And you'll hear horrible stories from museum creators about samples of Petrus being taken out with large chisels and damaging the skull. And now other researchers being much, much more careful about how they sample about the sampling conditions, about the implications of museum resources. One of the other shocking things which I've now learned is that when you come to publish, uh, not actually informing the archaeologists and researchers of what you've been doing. So, is it a simple story? Is it clear that we should be moving forward for, with integrated analysis for everything? Probably not. Uh, in fact, what we have found is it doesn't always work. Sometimes combining samples together actually is suboptimal. For instance, we've been trying to work on, on enamel, and enamel has a very rich proteome, but it's a very, very low concentration proteome, so we need quite lots of large amounts of material. Whereas isotope scientists can work with very small amounts of enamel. Um, sometimes it's not uh, appropriate for a bleeding edge method to be applied to an important sample if it's not going to work. And we have seen far, far too many examples of bleeding edge methods being applied and nothing being generated from them. More importantly, I think we need to engage the archeologists. Um, is the analysis redundant? Do we actually need that analysis? And then I think the thing that actually you know, here am I, standing in Copenhagen, working at Cambridge University as well. Um, it's great for me to be in a very well-resourced environment, but I think there is this really this concern at the moment about sort of the, the elitism of some of this scientific archaeology based in a very few well-funded institutions. And I think one of the things we really have to think about now is have an archaeology-led, not a science-led, set of studies, and also thinking to what extent the work can be done locally. And I, that's why I think this new European research platform in heritage science, which Axitilo is really now much trying to become much more archaeologically focused, I think will help us move forward. And that is my final slide. Thank you. I can't hear any questions. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what we have been trying to do, and I think I'm most happy with what we've been doing with parchment uh, there, because we have this Zooms protocol, which is extremely cheap. We've been basically able to analyze everything that everyone has asked us to send because what we've done with that technique is we've developed a sampling protocol which can be done by the conservators in the libraries and we have enough funding at least for the next three years as well. We've managed to keep the funding going actually for about, about eight years now, which means that there is no cost essentially to the conservators and we are very much led by them and I've really enjoyed that project because of that. But they're asking at the moment simple questions, but what of course we now want to ask is parchment, or as with everything else is, well, we can get the species, we want to get the sex, we want to get whether they're castrates, we want to get the genetic region, we want to get the signals from the isotopes and the rainfall, you know, and, and of course then everything starts to get more expensive. And I think one of the things is that we should be looking at low cost methods which we can apply on large scale. And in the case of the parchment, the fact we've been able to analyze more than 5,000 samples of very well dated parchment over geographical space and time has meant that we can actually start to see really interesting trends emerging. 
But I think one of the problems is that because of this bleeding edge science element to a lot of this, and it's a problem with funding agencies. If you go to ERC, if you go to major national funding agencies, they want you to be doing the leading edge, bleeding edge stuff, which is the most expensive, which you can do on the fewest samples. And so very often then um, you might do this stuff on, on, on a handful. And I think it's, it's, it's beholden upon the scientists. It's now happening certainly with genomics. Um, and you can see the strength of that in the recent work, say, on the, the wonderful study of a population from a southern German valley where so many individuals were analyzed and integrated with isotopes, a study that Philip Stockhammer led. Um, you can really see the benefit of the larger scale studies. So I think the reality is um, archaeologists are quite good at having no money. And I think that that is forcing the scientists to come up with more cost-effective ways of doing the work. And if you look at the cost of most biomolecular analysis, they have fallen relative to radiocarbon dating very substantially in the last 10 years, therefore opening things up more. But what I don't like is the sense that because it has to be done at the bleeding edge, it can be only done in a few limited institutions. I didn't answer your question. I just ranted. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the answer is never enough money. Um, no, I mean, there is some quite, there's a very interesting uh, series come out um, on parasites, health and disease published by the Royal Society. And Anne Stone has just got a paper with her colleagues in that, which is actually talking about pathology and how we can begin to integrate. There's, but no, I mean, it's one of those things where, yes, you're quite right. Somebody should write a paper about this. And I think it should be from an archaeological standpoint with some scientists. But no, you're absolutely right. There is... Um, this is me ranting at the moment. What I would say is the Wellcome Trust um, uh, presentation is all online. Uh, with all, I got all the speakers to put their slides into Google Slides, and there's two sets of slides there. The slides from the meeting and the second set, which people can comment upon. So I can share that link. And that was really hearing from lots of different people from different standpoints, some of whom thought we should integrate far more, and others who actually thought it was dangerous because it was going to lead to this elitist effect and it was going to lead to unnecessary analysis and poorly uh, data-driven studies rather than hypothesis-driven studies. So that is available and to be looked at. And I can share that.
would like to give you an outline of my talk. And uh, it is, I would like to make this specification right away that the talk relates to um, human um, remains of non-skeletal origin from um, basically non-skeletonized, uh, from skeletonized human remains. So where you have left in the grave mainly uh, human bones effectively, at least at first sight. The talk will focus on uh, one deposit on teeth known as ancient human dental calculus, because this is my area of expertise and I've done quite a lot of research. Also, we have a project in collaboration between University of York and uh, Star C with Ephemia Nikita on uh, this type of evidence. So I thought it was important to share with you uh, the importance of this uh, deposit on teeth, also because uh, it is a, a very important archaeological uh, deposit, but it's been used less than other one. So guidelines for sampling in the field and in the lab are not as known as other type of archaeological evidence. However, despite the focus is on dental calculus, I believe that a talk that touches uh, non-skeletal human remains from ancient graves need to touch the topic of intestinal parasite. And I will also do a very brief mention about the recovery of information from soil analysis. I know that a colleague will talk about uh, microstratigraphy in soil in uh, this workshop, so it will be just a very brief mention. So, first of all, let's hit the subject of ancient human dental calculus. What is effectively ancient human dental calculus? It's nothing else than the stuff on teeth that your dentist remove when you go there for a dental cleaning. And in general, is mineralized dental plaque, what you remove with your toothbrush every time you brush your teeth. It is a mineralized bacterial biofilm along with calcium phosphate, calcium, calcium carbonate. And it's because it's forming in the human mouth, during its formation process, it can entrap, it can capture a variety of food particles and other organic matter that happens to be in the saliva. And um, it can form both on teeth, but also in modern living people, it can form on dental appliance. One very important thing of ancient human dental calculus, and even today, is that is the result of a very complex interaction and acti bacterial activity in the mouth, but it is the result of um, an interaction, a synergy between the bacteria and the saliva, because the bacteria need the saliva to, to survive and also to produce this mineralized deposit. This, an, this is an aspect really important for the study, because it means that at the moment the person chooses to leave, so the, effectively when the individual dies, this deposit doesn't form anymore. So anything that uh, the mineralized uh, bacterial film, this dental calculus has, in, has captured during its formation is within the life of the individual. So it's really, really important. And uh, it has a very high archeological integrity. It is uh, normally connected to poor oral hygiene and poor health, but also uh, we're learning that the, the formation of dental calculus um, depends also by certain personal predisposition some people form dental calculus, some other don't. It has been linked quite uh, persistently to a disease known as periodontal disease, which is uh, a gum disorder that can ultimately cause the loss uh, of teeth. And it has been normally linked to, it's very common, to diet that is based on starch and soft food. However, we are learning, studying this deposit, uh, that uh, the formation process is actually very com very complex, so it varies and you can link to a wealth of uh, uh, living condition, not just uh, simply starchy food and soft food diet. So how does it look on ancient teeth? So this uh, slide shows you a little bit with the arrow, but you can see the deposit on the entire dentition of this medieval individual from my PhD uh, from Leicester. And what you can see here is that at glance, it can look a little bit like soil. So I would like you to keep in mind this information. This is particularly tricky to spot if the soil condition are particularly rich in carbonates because the color uh, of the soil and the concretion sometimes calcium carbonate forms on teeth can be uh, confused with dental calculus. So it looks like, like this. In general, it's loosely attached to the tooth, but it can vary the, how 
the, the thickness of, of dental calculus to teeth can vary from one individual to another one. Now, because dental calculus tends to form into the human mouth and it preserves via effectively mineralization, small particles of food, it has been used initially a lot in paleobotany and human paleontology and paleoanthropology in general, because it, uh, it entombs, it uh, captures fragments of plant tissue from the diet. And uh, as many of you probably know, it, the information from plants uh, in diet are really, really difficult to obtain from uh, very ancient skeletal remains, especially, especially very deep in the human past, because they don't preserve uh, very well. And as Evie Margariti said at the beginning, very often if it's not burnt or charred, it's very hard uh, for us to retrieve it in the ground. So effectively it has been is built its big name in the field of bioarchaeology because of the utility it has in reconstructing paleo diets and because uh, the subject of paleo diet is also very popular um, with the press has gone around quite has hit the public interest quite a lot it is also a very important biomolecular evidence and this is a slide by my, my colleague Camilla Speller. I'm not a bio, uh, bio, biomolecular archaeologist so I rely on the information that effectively she has given me here. But what you can see is that um, dental calculus is a reservoir of biomolecules predominantly of a bacterial origin, but we can extract dietary proteins, uh, human DNA, uh, human proteins, even if in a lower proportion compared to bacteria. I will not uh, stay a long time on this because I think one of the most novel aspect in the study of ancient human dental calculus is the evidence that doesn't, is not pertinent to biomolecular evidence or to diet. And is the fact that uh, what we are beginning to understand is that uh, we can uh, consider effectively the human mouth as a dust trap. I will define very briefly dust. Dust is um, basically a mixture of tiny particles of the world around us that is breaking down. We tend to dust it off. And what we are learning is that uh, one particular part of this dust surrounding us, the particulate matter uh, of debris below 10 microns, so is very volatile. So what, it has, what happens is that if you are um, practicing a craft or you are in an environment particularly reach of these particles, like this uh, poor child on the right, you, uh, chances are that this debris, this particulate matter, will enter the human mouth. And if you are forming the dental calculus, this particulate matter will be incorporated into the forming dental calculus and they will preserve from millennia on teeth. This is an extraordinary useful piece of information to have from a skeleton because it can inform us so much about the environment the ancient individual experienced during life. And you can, I think this picture uh, helps to, to sort of picture a little bit um, the living condition that many people still experience today uh, in a developing country. And what you can see here is something that would be very common in ancient time in many human activities that deal with uh, brick making, pottery making, stonework. So it's very precious. Now, I don't expect you to believe me on just by one slide on modern population. So I have chosen two crafts to show you that um, two um, particulate matter that comes from um, crafting activity that I have retrieved from dental calculus. On the left, uh, you can see these tiny little blue particles is a particulate of uh, lapis lazuli dust that is generated during pigment preparation. And this was from a case study from the Oliva Dalai that was published last year and was an international um, collaboration. This study um, has, uh, became very popular with the press because uh, it was uh, the first time that we could use skeletal remains to link uh, a woman, a female individual, to book production in the archaeological record. For me, however, this was not just uh, um, about being able to link and see the work of um, a female individual, the role in, uh, in art of this individual from skeletal remains. One of the most important uh, uh, things that we learned from that study is that effectively we can retrieve in situ dust generating from stonework. Pigments are 
particular type of stone, in this case, lapis lazuli. But if you can think about the monumental scale of stonework in the past, you know, many people were involved in it, being able to track those involved in stonework is going to be a very major step if we can do that from skeletal remains. Another type of debris that is beginning to show on a systematic way is that from textile and fiber that are used in the in textile manufacturing. On the right you have an example of flax, but it has been found cotton, for instance, I have retrieved wool and uh, I'm currently working on uh, material from the city of Padua and with the um, um, with Dr. Efimia Nikita, we're trying to look at dental wear combined with fibers as well, to try to learn a little bit more about the workforce. So this is of paramount importance, I believe, um, to exploit, even if this deposit has been mainly used so far for diet. Now, another line of evidence that has been really neglected in dental calculus is that of soil, minerals and rock. In here, you can see an in situ part, um, fragment of soil debris. This has enormous potential, of being, although it's not been uh, studied very much, because uh, soil can come with a lot of information and it can help us to understand if debris of plants that we may see or charcoal that we may see in calculus have come through diet or through soil fragments. And uh, it, it helps us a lot to interpret the uh, remains we see effectively. So we are basically developing technique that allowed us to exploit all line of evidence from this deposit and wherever possible we are trying to develop technique that allowed us to study this evidence in situ in the calculus flag because normal um, analysis at the moment what we can do the most for the extraction of particulate of food for example of other debris are destructive and obviously dental calculus is very very small. Now this um, is quite interesting because uh, it bridges, it truly bridges the discipline. So I want to illustrate this concept by using a slide that comes from my PhD and I tested the potential of dental calculus as environmental evidence from a medieval, um, Anglo-Saxon and medieval site from Leicester. And I have here, I have plotted the, the type of debris that I have systematically re re retrieved from skeletal remains against a reconstruction by my code for Vision of Ancient Leicester. And this reconstruction was made by Mike using the archaeological evidence, combining the skeletal evidence we had, combining the environmental evidence and that from archaeology that, that allowed us to reconstruct a little bit the building. And what you can see is that effectively dental calculus had the debris coming from all um, natural and built environment around. Now we start with the urban debris. I have retrieved regularly. It's been retrieved in other studies as well. Pollen. We begin to be, uh, we begin to see that, for instance, feather barbules from birds are consistently uh, appearing in the dental calculus. And um, Herbor debris like smoke as well. There is material that I had interpreted as roofing material, textile fiber, and dietary remains. So this deposit is truly precious because it sits on a skeleton, in, on skeleton, so it comes with all the information that you can possibly extract from an ancient individual from uh, his or her human remains, so sex, age, pathology, but simultaneously it encapsulates information from the environment that the individual has experienced during life. So it bridges in an incredibly nice way the individual and the environment that individual experience during life. Despite this, uh, there are some issues in the sampling and uh, in its preservation that come from the field and the laboratory. And some of them are due to the fact that in order to extract the majority of information from the dental calculus, what we need to do is to make sure that this deposit, the archaeological integrity of this deposit is preserved. Because dental calculus sits on teeth, on teeth, uh, it is exposed to the same um, soil that the skeleton has been put in. And on the left, top left, you can see a picture at the insection of calculus and the arrows point to boreal soil adhering tightly to the calculus itself.
below it there is um, a dental calculus sample, so a very small fleck. And what you can see here is tiny little remains of soil, the black dots are area of um, remains from the burial ground, even after normal protocol for cleaning. So we need to ensure that no soil is adhering to the calculus. And we can achieve that by cleaning it with a tiny, very small acupuncture needle and a weak solution of hydrochloric acid. And the central, the big slide, um, picture in the middle shows you the process. So we, we then basically treat the, the surface, even if there is a tiny loss. And then we end up um, with a surface that is perfectly clean under a thorough examination under the microscope. We aim to, do, to achieve that. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. We can have doubt regarding how clean a sample is. Um, so I will show you a little bit better uh, what I mean for that. This is a calculus sample from a project from a collaboration with the British Museum, scientific research led by Carl Aaron and the bioarchaeology group led by Daniel Antoine. And is a digital 3D image and it shows you the surface of the calcul now uneven. This is this calcul has been cleaned, but in the area where there are these deepening of the calculus, this undulation is still retained a mixture of soil. And uh, in this case, the material comes from Sudan. So there is some putrefaction fluids that have dried out on the sample, literally gluing soil to the calculus. So we need to remove that soil, but we also need to keep an eye that post-mortem process have not insert a small fragment of soil in the crevices of the calculus that we may be not able to see. So what we tend to do and what we ask to help us to do that, to preserve this archaeological integrity and interpret our debris at its best, is that whenever the dental calculus, in general, the skeleton is clean, to please keep any soil that is adhering to the teeth that you may need if you're a specialist or you are in the field, any soil that you need to remove, try to please sample it out a little portion. This would help us a lot in the lab to ensure that the debris that we are uh, looking at under the microscope is indeed that it is coming from dental calculus. As I said, the potential of this contamination is remote, but considering the very uneven surface of the calculus, it can happen. And sometimes the sample can be so small that treating them with hydrochloric acid may be not a very good choice, even if it's just done with a tiny acupuncture needle. Now, obviously, uh, as I said, the, the cleaning is paramount, but the cleaning uh, of teeth is part of the curatorial and study needs in the field of osteoarchaeology. This process, even before your sampling from dental calculus, can cause problems to dental calculus research. First of all, dental calculus can easily come off naturally. So sometimes it just drop off in storage or maybe in the field so that we cannot do anything about it. But it can also come off if too much force is effectively applied to the surface of the tooth while cleaning. So please, if in your career, if part of your duty will be um, cleaning um, osteoarchaeological skeletal remains for a specialist or for yourself, if you are a specialist, be extremely, extremely gentle with it because it's important that um, we, keep, we keep this material for research today and for future research. Another thing to avoid is to please do not glue teeth or do not well, try not to hold the teeth in place using tiny little bit of glue or post-it blue thing that sometimes I see that in, uh, in skeleton people tend to want the teeth in the right position. So they tend to hold them with something in the mandible to take picture that can leave traces and that can be a problem. And absolutely, even if this practice is no longer done, please do not glue teeth with the calculus because we, are, we will be unable to do anything with it. Now, one thing that I would like to point out, because I have seen it on my own personal experience, is that further loss can happen if the calculus drop off the tooth in the container in which the tooth is kept. So this is a typical example of a calculus that has been retrieved from a tiny bag where the teeth were kept. And uh, what happens is that the calculus and the fragments sounds very small, then they get mixed with other dirt that may be still adhering to teeth and the mandible and the bones. Normally, it's, there is great temptation 
to sample the largest fragment and throw away the rest of the debris that you can see in the slide. However, for us, any little bit matters. So if this is the case, I would like to ask people and to keep in mind maybe this, that it would be better to collect all the, the dust that you see at the bottom with the calculus at the bottom of the bag or the container and send that to the specialist flagging the issue because then under a microscope with some little test we are able um, to tell if it's dirt or if it's calculus even if the fragments are really really little and considering the overall size of calculus sometimes it's only a few milligrams this maybe make a big difference on the number of analysis that we can do now, when sampling for analysis, there are some things that may be helpful uh, for the specialist and in general for the discipline, because in this case, for instance, medieval material, uh, you can see there is a lot of dental calculus deposit. Sometimes this is not always the case, or the deposit can be very, very small. I have worked as with the dental calculus sample as little as a quarter of a milligram, so tiny. And this is the case for um, dental calculus from um, human remains so very deep in the human past. So as I said, dental calculus can easily come off, but it can also stick to it, to the tooth, quite, quite tightly. So one thing to keep in mind, if you have the task of sampling and you find yourself in the situation in which you need to scrape the calculus off, it can happen, then please try to avoid damage on the teeth. And uh, a good practice to do, if possible with time and where you are, please try to take a picture before and after sampling. This is, may not be the possibility uh, if you are uh, sampling. I've been in a project, for example, with uh, Fimi and Nikita in the middle of the Sahara or in situation where you have very limited amount of time and it's very time consuming. But in situation like museums environment where the time constrictions are less, just please invest the time to take a picture before and after. The other thing to take in account is, is to assess very carefully how much you can sample today and to allow for future research. And the reason why I am flagging this is that at the moment, the discipline is such an early stage that we are developing, we're still developing protocol to maximize the extraction of information. And at the moment, we don't have protocols that allowed us to work on the same calculus for all disciplines, all line of evidence that we can extract from it. So be very careful in what you're going to do if the material is uh, limited. Uh, at the moment, for example, for the population I'm working with the British Museum, one uh, sample strategy that we have adopted because we have the possibility to do this is to sample calculus, only calculus that has um, another deposit on the corresponding teeth. So, for instance, if there is a good deposit of dental calculus on the third molar um, of the mandible at the right side, we sample it if we have dental calculus on the mandible on the third molar in, um, in the other side of the mouth, basically. This is an ideal situation and it's not always possible, but it's really worth spending a little bit of time and trying to tailor the sampling strategy as we normally do, but sometimes it's very tempting. I can tell you that it's very tempting to go for it. And in a few occasions, I wish I could have sample and I really had to force myself not to. So uh, one type of information that I would also like, like people to um, collect routinely, and I have not done it in my early stage of this research, and I wish I'd done it now. So it's made upon personal mistake. Please record whenever possible the tooth from where the calculus was taken. When I started my PhD, I didn't consider how important the location of the calculus is. And this is, uh, has been a mistake. Uh, many of my teeth now are sample. I had to go back and sample on very known tooth teeth. And this is due to the fact that at the moment, we are unable to tell what portion of the individual we are studying, what portion of life is represented in the dental calculus. Coming from a non osteoarchaeological background, I truly underestimated how much is interesting and powerful to combine estimated age of tooth eruption with estimated age of uh, individual death. 
which means that we can actually narrow down a little bit the window of time in which this calculus for narrowing down in the portion of the life of the, that individual. This is pretty extraordinary, and I think we should it, it should come with that information in sample. The other things that we don't really understand is how the, fl the flux of the saliva affect the information that the dental calculus is capturing. So if possible, provide indication of where on the tooth the calculus for or sample. For instance, if it's in the internal part of the mouth or if it's on the sternum. The saliva, the dynamic of the saliva in the mouth is very different in different regions of the mouth. So this would be very important, important because in the future, when this discipline will have built very large data set, we will be able to combine this information from different parts of the mouth, different teeth, in different area of the world, and we will be able to look at trend. So it would be lovely to really begin, begin to record this. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes people tend to sample by weight. So it would be important to retrieve this information. Now, uh, another thing, I worked for many years in the commercial sector and in an area of the world, England, where uh, um, a lot of uh, um, osteoarchaeology happens in Roman and medieval uh, period because uh, um, the, the, the development of uh, urban centers. And these are very large uh, skeletal um, assemblages and very often we deal with uh, Christian burials. So there is a lot of pressure um, where I work to make sure that a portion of, at least a good portion of the skeletal assemblage are um, reburied for respect. And this is particularly felt for, um, for Christian graves, but in general there is effort to do that. Now, uh, for, during the burial, what we tend to do um, in general is to make sure that there are samples of teeth, um, and now the petrus is becoming um, common as a stored sample. We collect teeth, we collect ribs, sometimes you can retain um, bones that have specific pathology for teaching and future research. But there, it's very, very rare. I don't think I have ever come across any sampling strategy before a burial that included dental calculus. In an ideal world, because dental calculus is not strictly speaking human remains, it's a bacteria um, deposit on teeth, even if it contains information about the individual, you can bypass the problem. You, can, you could, in theory, sample it all. This is not always possible, that's fine. So, there are two things uh, that uh, needs to be to be done. I think it would be good to see that incorporated into practice. First of all, again, the recording. If you have to choose which tooth uh, you are sampling for, please again um, record the tooth from where the calculus is, is taken. Provide the information of its location. And in this case, you are probably not going to probably not be under the same time pressure you are on site. So it would be lovely if you could tell, uh, if you could take a picture before and after. When sampling, if you cannot sample all the teeth, try if wherever possible to sample for multiple teeth. Again, this is important because at the moment we cannot extract all information from just one sample. We have to send to spe different specialists different sample. Try to sample from teeth that are at a different age, so that potentially you can narrow down the window of time of that life of the individual you're studying. So that would be very lovely. And if possible, again, sample book and a lingual surface. So these are the key factors, that, and I would really like to promote this sampling strategy before the burial. Now, another subject that I will brief touch uh, I've been uh, discussing more detailed dental calculus is the data that don't actually see from the skeleton itself, like sticking on it, like calculus, but that are part are strictly linking to the, the decomposition of the human body, the human body itself. So the data from, I will categorize them as a whole, the data from soil. Now, one thing that I uh, would like to say is this, that um, the soil had, 
has a story to tell too, even if they are not skeletal remains. And it is a very valuable source of information from ancient Greece, but it's still, in my opinion, at least in the area of the world where I have worked, still much, much less studied than other remains. And there is a, through the eyes of parasite, but also through soil micromorphology, inorganic geochemistry, and trace organic chemical analysis, soil analysis of various types, can, we can reveal, this analysis can reveal body decay, even when there are no bones left. Preburial treatment and mortuary practice, like in Balmy, if there are evidence of clothing, we will see parasite in a minute, and information about diet, disease, and even drug use. So it, it's important that we use it. What we need to keep in mind when we need, we deal with soil from field in the field, and you will see in a little bit when we sample, is that soil, we deal with it as something static, but in reality, soil, it, the soil is a very dynamic creature, I would say, because it's very much alive in the way it responds to changes. And there are a number of uh, uh, changes that happen during the decomposition of the body. So it has a story of very complex interaction between what is inside it, what is buried with it, and the change in the environment, uh, the type of vegetation. So this information is quite uh, commonly very entangled in very complex puzzles. So it's really important that uh, the same strategy for soil follow common sense, uh, but also some thorough some thorough guidelines, basically. So one information that I wish would be studied a little bit more and sample more routinely is that from uh, parasite, in particular in this case, I will give you the example of parasites over. And intestinal parasites, for example, that are retrieved from the area of the pelvis and the sacrum from graves, they, can, they were very common in uh, ancient population. They still are in many parts of the world. They are very easy to... Uh, to, to catch if you live in poor, con in poor hygienic condition, but it's not just about poor hygienic condition. Uh, fecal material of animals and people has a very um, good value as a fertilizer. In the past and in many areas today of the world, fecal material is used as fertilizer. In the situation in which this fecal material is used as fertilizer, then the, the cultural barrier uh, the people have towards this material, this poo effectively, they drop. You don't perceive that anymore uh, very much as fecal material. It becomes something useful to you. And sometimes it can come into your mouth simply because you're eating food that has been contaminated. Many parts of, uh, part of an animal intestinal, the intestine, for example, can be eaten. They can be used in craft. So in the past, there was a lot of exposure and they are retrieved uh, in many, many situations. In this picture, you have two of the most common parasites I have encountered in my commercial career in England. And they are uh, small intestinal roundworm and whipworms. And um, this can uh, affect the way you assimilate food. So the retrieval of this line of evidence from um, the soil can help the osteoarchaeology to understand the certain patterns seen in the skeletal remains can be potential, potentially due to a poor assimilation of food rather than not having food. So they provide very complementary information. And uh, normally um, they are sampled um, from the area of the pelvis, but because you've seen the, the scheme before, the soil is a dynamic entity and the fecal material was so common in the past as fertilizer shifted around and also animals were a little bit more free range than they are today. There are parasite ova in, in archaeological soil outside graves as well very often. So soil shifting can cause contamination. So there are uh, sampling procedures to follow and you have to sample the pelvis, the area of the pelvis, the area of which, you know, the bottom of, above the sacrum. But the, please, it is important that um, control samples are taken from this location, like the head, around the shoulder and neck, uh, the long bones, the feet, and inside and outside the grave. So that uh, if we find, we will, in the lab, we will analyze the area of the pelvis, assess if there are parasites. If parasites are present, then we move into the time-consuming work of control samples to assess if what we see is effectively linked to presence of soil all over the place, or parasites all over the place, or if it is something that really is um, an infestation of the individual we are studying. 
Now, another example that I would like uh, to provide you is uh, the analysis that can be done from uh, soil micromorphology in organic chemistry and trace organic chemical analysis applied to the Iron Age uh, cliff burial in Yemen. This, brought, this uh, study was um, part of the inter-archive project at the University of York from colleagues from BioArc in the Department of Archaeology. And they combined the soil evidence, soil, which you will see, you will see soil micromorphology in a talk during this workshop, but they basically analyzing at microscopic level with geochemical technique the soil, it is still possible, even from the soil, retrieve evidence of skin, air fragment, micro layering in the burial, and they retrieve even traces of cholesterol. So be, not, be aware that this, uh, there are a, a number of neglected line of evidence that could be applied and that still require a lot of research. When we move on the field, when you are dealing with soil, so when, um, obviously, inside the grave, archaeological integrity is of paramount importance. Now, having worked in a uh, um, northern environment and a lot of Christian graves, sometimes when the scheme of sampling strategies, like the one you see on the right, they are very, I relate very easily because of the, the way the, the body is laid to rest. But there are cultures where this is not possible, and we will see an, an example in a minute. And in general, you can see at the top one is again the parasites one, and the bottom one is the number of soil samples that were taken for the interarchive project. So it's time consuming and it's very expensive. So the archaeological integrity of this material is paramount. The situation can be quite complicated when you are dealing, like uh, on the case of the left that um, Ephemia Nikita discussed before. So in, in the area of the pelvis, sometimes you have the bones of the fingers if the position of the hands were placed above the pelvis, they are out of the tummy, for instance. And this is quite common sometimes in Christian graves. And or if you have remains of an infant, for example, in this case, uh, a postmortem fatal extrusion. So it is important that some caution is um, is uh, applied when you sample. If you feel that the sample the sample you are taking doesn't reflect only the, the pelvis area, that you are not in an area with sufficient archaeological integrity, then maybe maybe worth not doing it. This is not always so easy to assess. For example, on the right top, you see a Garamantian grave from a desert migration pro the project, and you can see that in, in many many areas of the world, the bodies are buried in a crouch position. This is not always so easy in this situation to understand what to sample now. Or you have uh, um, mass graves. On the bottom, on the right, you see a mass grave from what we initially thought was a plague uh, pit. In reality, it was an um, Anglo-Norman mass burial, probably something um, we don't know exactly what killed these people. But understanding there the contribution, for example, of parasite analysis of each individual is going to be almost impossible. So sometimes things can get very complicated. And what I would like to suggest in this case are some um, things that uh, I had forgotten when I was a field archaeologist and sometimes I didn't consider so much, but I think they're really important. Remember that the specialist may have not been on, in the field. So sometimes uh, you, are, you are in the lab and you are overwhelmed with work, you don't have time to see the reality of the field. And it is important that the information that you face in the field, for example, are, pro are provided to people in the lab. So that I mean, it's really, really valuable information the field people can provide to us. And I would also like to, see, uh, to say this, uh, because it's something I have experienced uh, more recently, is that there is a growing number of archaeological scientists that come from biological background, and some of them may have never been on site at all. And it's really difficult to relate uh, to fieldwork reality if you've never been on a site. Um, keep a record, therefore, of what uh, you see in the field, the, uh, thinking a little bit about the um, the field, the lab specialist. This is, this is, I'm saying this for where you have some very serious doubt as well, it's particularly important. So flag any doubt on the archaeological integrity of the sample you are taking so that the specialist in the lab can reconstruct its story. It's really important that uh, the experience that you have in the field is transmitted to people that may not necessarily have it. Now, what I have done here, 
don't know if you can see the link, is I selected some readings throughout the presentation. I have added links and um, to the papers that I have used, and I think it's quite important that if you're interested, you may want to have a look at them. But there are other papers that you may be interested in. Um, one of them is a scientific, a published scientific report, and is the evidence of fish. So we tend to look uh, at uh, plant in human dental calculus. They, uh, there is now a growing body of evidence that the dental calculus capture zoological evidence. So that's quite important. And then on the right, you see a paper that uh, it's, it flags the need of joining protocols, of being able to work on multiple lines of evidence. But what I would like to flag most of anything is something that Matthew Collins briefly mentioned before, and this is the huge effort that Historic England produced um, in, um, in the form of field and laboratory guidelines. And they touch, uh, in this case, you see environmental archaeology, but they touch all disciplines of archaeological science. They are obviously focused for um, Britain, the, the situation, therefore, are very useful, I think, for Northern Europe. But they also embrace all their archaeological contests, but they are incredibly useful. They're very, very clear and they are completely open access in the form of PDF. So it would be lovely if you can go and have a look at it and join Matthew in saying it, it would be great if this type of resources would be available for many regions in the world because the archaeological evidence and the soil as well are so different from one area to another one. So to conclude, there are more than human bones when it comes to skeletal evidence in ancient grave. Dental calculus is a very promising line of evidence. If you have any doubt on what to do at any time, it can happen, no matter how experienced you are, then maybe uh, sample. If you don't know what to do with the sample, then sample it. Because if you don't, uh, if you don't sample, then th the chance to look into it is, um, is lost and then you may be able to work it out if there is sufficient archaeological integrity with the specialist your work. The other thing to keep very much in mind, especially with dental calculus research, is that we are really learning how to deal with this deposit. So if you are in a situation in which your skeletal remains are going for a burial, please include dental calculus in the set of samples you're going to keep for future generation of archaeological scientists. I very much thank you for your attention and I hope you will find this useful. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, maybe we have uh, uh, time for like one question because it's, uh, uh, we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, Effie? Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita, for this. Uh, just a basic question. You mentioned already how we should sample the dental calculus in terms of how to select the teeth uh, and the deposits. Can you very briefly tell us... Effie, what I don't know if you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Ah, can you hear me now? One, two. I cannot hear you. Fine. Hold, on, hold on. So if you want to type the can question. You, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No? Okay, never mind then. Okay, uh, well, never mind. Then it's okay. Uh, it's, okay. It's, yeah, it's, it's okay, yes. Um, all right, we're, we're going. Thank you, Anita. I hope that she's. I don't know if she's, uh, she's, she can hear us. Uh, we're going to move on into like uh, one minute to the next uh, uh, lecture by uh, Pan uh, Dr. Panagiotis Karkanas, the director of the Wiener Laboratory of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, and uh, co-authored with uh, Dr. Misini Guma, uh, who is affiliated with the Wiener Laboratory and here, the Cyprus Institute. She's a member of the Keros Project. And uh, Misini actually is here in, uh, in Cyprus, and uh, she's in the next building. But uh, because she, she came from Greece, she's in quarantine. We don't uh, allow her to, to mingle with us, with the general population. And um, with here is Dr. Um, uh, Kostas Paschalidis from the National um, Archaeological Museum of Athens. And he's, uh, he, he came to exchange ideas about uh, museums and uh, methods. But he's, he's in isolation as well, so we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, see him. Uh, uh, Mircin is going to talk uh, to us about perspectives of the, on the role of microstratigraphy in archaeological research. Let's see if she can uh, hear us.
Yes, I, I think so. I don't know. Let's see how Angelos is going to do it. Hello. Yes, we can. We can hear you. Yes. Mircini, can you hear us? No. Hello? <laughs> no. Uh. Hello? 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 <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you, yes? Ah, there is anything a delay? I think there is a delay on the on the sound. Hello. Mm. Um, is there a delay? Can you hear me now? There is a delay, that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. So, shall I start? No, okay. Can you please turn off the sound so she will start? That's what Eric said. Yes. And delay the clock does not work. Yes, it's picking up. Can you please? Okay. Um, so, welcome. Uh, greetings from next door. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, workshop. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, my talk is on the micromorphological analysis of uh, archaeological sediments. Um, this is a study of archaeological sites in a micro scale, and my talk will be div divided in three parts. Uh, the first uh, includes an overview of the method and the research questions it is concerned with. Uh, the second will include some practical information on fieldwork, uh, sampling, and processing of the samples in the laboratory. And in the last part, I'm going to give you some um, examples, uh, case studies from uh, different geographical areas and chronological periods in uh, Greece and Cyprus. Um, micromorphological analysis has been used to answer um, geoarchaeological questions. And um, I'm sorry. And um, uh, Colin Renfrew was the first uh, to give a definition of this uh, method of this discipline, uh, describing it as the um, discipline which uses the skills of a geologist, uh, using his concern on soil, sediments, and landforms. Um, concerning an archaeological site in order to investigate the location, uh, the formation and uh, the preservation and the uh, life history of a site. Taking each of these points one by one, um, the first one is the location, that is the landscape uh, of an archaeological site. And uh, we know that the landscape is subject to changes due, a num or due to a number of um, environmental, climatic uh, factors, uh, tectonics. Therefore, what we see nowadays is uh, sometimes differs greatly from uh, uh, the archaeological site, from the landscape the archaeological site uh, is associated with. 
Therefore, we used the archaeological tools in order to reconstruct all these relic landforms on which an archaeological site is found. Turning to the next point, that is site formation processes. Um, all formations create archaeological deposits. Uh, these are, however, mixed with the natural sediments that are brought in, brought in the site. And, ah, okay, I'm sorry for a bit confused with the different screens. <laughs> okay. Um, so, cultural sediments are mixed with natural deposits that are brought in the site uh, from uh, a number of uh, factors as uh, the wind um, or the rainwater and this creates uh, complex stratigraphic sequences that we can hardly often interpret. A good example of these processes is the life cycle of materials um, like mud bricks. These are very often are um, constructed by raw materials that we find in the surroundings of the site and therefore, when these are disintegrated and dissolved with the effect of the water, uh, they retain very few characteristics of their uh, structure as mud bricks and they resemble more the um, raw material from which they were built. And therefore, uh, we can hardly differentiate on the stratigraphy uh, the role from the cultural materials. Uh, the last part, the last part um, is the preservation of a site and that is also affected by a number of environmental factors but also uh, human disturbance. Uh, so therefore a site can be um, buried under a coarse colubium or a flood um, and in this way it can be preserved and buried. In other cases it can be exposed and uh, gradually eroded. Um, so, environmental, climatic uh, um, conditions, uh, but also the um, construction material of the site plays a degree in the preservation uh, and subsequent, pre subsequent preservation of the site. All these uh, environmental conditions and the changes in human behavior are reflected in uh, soils and sediments. Therefore, um, we have to study this connecting material of archaeological remains uh, in order to trace them. Uh, archaeology has uh, used many conventional sedimentological analyses, uh, which, uh, however, um, fail to differentiate the different processes uh, that affect the same material. Um, and they also have failed to differentiate materials that use the same uh, analytical uh, measurement. For example, this a white layer that you see on this section uh, can be interpreted as accumulation of ashes or uh, soil carbonates, or it can be a constructed lime plaster for floor. Uh, however, uh, bulk sedimentological analysis will give will tell us that it includes uh, it contains calcite. However, it won't tell us where this calcite originates from and how it was formed. Therefore, the most prominent uh, method to study these uh, changes is the micromorphological analysis. And that is because through this uh, type of method we can use, we can study the intact arrangement of uh, archaeological remains in their connected sediments uh, under the microscope in high resolution. Uh, we want to examine the human activities in the scale that they occur, and this is a micro scale. And the, maybe the greatest input of this uh, method is that since we extract our data through excavation in a way extracting and partly destroying the micro context, we get all the uh, valuable information for, from the um, individual analysis and then we can put the material back to the original context and see how these are interrelated. Um, in this thing section, you can see an example of the micro scale of analysis. This is five millimeters. This is, these different layers are uh, of uh, five millimeters thickness. 
and they include uh, organic uh, accumulations, accumulations of organic remains at the bottom. These are uh, sharply separated with, by, uh, with the overlying layer, with this, which is charcoal. And these two materials are then uh, uh, mixed at the, uh, at the very top of the section uh, in a chaotic structure. Therefore, uh, we see that these uh, different structures reflect at least three different depositional processes that would be very difficult to differentiate uh, during excavation in such a detail. Uh, turning now to the um, practical part, and this is uh, fieldwork. Uh, micromorphology starts in the field. Um, we make macroscopic observations of the stratigraphy. We discuss with the archaeologist um, in order to have a research question for doing the analysis. And we select, after making drawings and taking pictures and detailed observation, we select this part of the stratigraphy that will answer our research question. Then we make a block um, of the sample. Uh, we carve it in the stratigraphy. We cover it uh, with plaster of Paris. And uh, after it is stabilized, we then um, extract it and we can see how sharp the boundaries of the individual layers look in a freshly ex extracted uh, sample. Um, we have to make sure uh, that most of the times we will need to transport these uh, samples in a laboratory. Therefore, they have to be um, carefully um, packed um, so that they are not broken. Then the time-consuming uh, process follows in the laboratory. The um, samples have to be oven dried and uh, then they are impregnated in the um, um, mixture of ferrocin and acetone. And when they get solidified, they become like a glass block. We cut them with the rock saw um, in a thickness, in slabs of thickness uh, of about uh, two uh, centimeters. You see on this left part a nipprocinated slab. Uh, this is then uh, cut into smaller samples of five to seven centimeters. Uh, we select them according to our research question again. And following a gradual polishing, we get to the final thin section, which is uh, 30 microns in thickness, which we study under the microscope in several magnifications. Here you can see a review of this process, starting uh, by the, uh, how the block looks in the field, uh, the impregnated slab, uh, the thin section, and the observations under the microscope. Um, I have to point here that this is not just a, these are not just different stages of processing in order to get to the final microscopic observations but there are actually scales, different scales of analysis. We take information from uh, every uh, stage of uh, this processing um, and we go back and forth uh, in uh, our final uh, observations under the microscope. We, leak, we look at the slab, we go back to our pictures from the field and we look at the thin sections in our computer screen in order to go to result the final interpretation. Uh, now I'm going to give you a few examples, case studies from different um, geographical areas, starting from northwestern Greece and from the earliest chronological case study, uh, which is the Neolithic lake dwelling site of uh, Dispio. The research question here is related to reconstruct the landscape before the initial habitation and how this changed with the human uh, presence. And we also wanted to trace um, episodes of destruction during the lifespan of the site. So we did course uh, in order to have a complete sequence uh, of uh, the stratigraphy of both the natural and anthropogenic deposits. And these included lake segments at the lower part. Um, these were then turned to uh, exposed sediments due to the lowering of the water levels. 
and on these uh, Mars, uh, Mars was formed uh, where we recorded the first uh, anthropogenic presence in the first of in the um, form of a uh, few charcoal fragments. And the first pile dwellings were built on this wet ground. Um, gradually, and as the houses collapsed and the anthropogenic material fell in the ground, and the finishing house was formed. And in this way, the um, environment turned transitionally to a more ter terrestrial one. And uh, at the final phases of the um, settlement, the structures were built on a terrestrial on a dry, dry ground. Therefore, uh, through micromorphological analysis, we were able to trace all these subtle uh, differences of environmental changes. And um, we understood that the first dwellers were uh, attracted by this marsh uh, deposit. Uh, which doesn't sound very attractive, but this is another very long story. Um, our next question was the, related to the um, period of habitation and uh, the destruction events that we could identify at the early stages of uh, uh, the settlement, the lake dwelling part of the settlement. Um, in lake dwelling sites, when the houses collapse in the wet ground, they create a plastic mixture of uh, sediments and charcoal and um, artifacts. And therefore, uh, we wanted to um, understand if this is lower uh, looking homogeneous part of the stratigraphy uh, that you can see here included one or more uh, episodes. The radiocarbon dates in this uh, case were are also inconclusive. So by um, um, doing micromorphological analysis, we were able to uh, see different, um, uh, different, different structures uh, of the materials. And in this way, we could identify at least three different destruction events. Um, therefore, um, by selecting in a later stage uh, charcoal fragments from these different layers, so we could uh, verify our uh, observations with um, simple thin results. Turning now to a completely different um, case study, and this uh, is the uh, the Cycladis and the early Cycladic sediment of uh, Dascalio. Um, this is a very densely occupied settlement, and uh, we have uh, uh, been able to see a number of occupational spaces and uh, exterior areas. The aim of the geological uh, project was uh, to identify occupational um, surfaces, and at the same time, we differentiate these from the natural processes that have affected the formation of the site. Um, during excavation, uh, one of these examples you can see on this uh, block of stratigraphy that is found in the interior of the room. And um, it looks rather uh, invariable. During excavation, we could identify fine-grained layers of uh, cemented sediments. And you can see under the microscope that they include fine-grained silty uh, lenses uh, interrupted by um, Sandy um, bands. This has been interpreted as a result of a, the room being filled by water in such a degree that these sediments would uh, settle in suspension. And they were interrupted by inflow of water of uh, higher energy. Um, the fact is that uh, due to the um, calcareous texture of, uh, of the sediments, uh, when they get wet and then they get dry, they get uh, cemented, compacted in a way that they very much resemble uh, man-made surfaces. Another challenging part of this project is uh, to uh, identify um, earthen floors. And this is a challenging part because they are very much uh, invariable from the natural silting up of the rooms. And um, you can see that in the field, in this picture from the field, but also in the impregnated slab, 
there is also a very subtle boundary between the lower sorted um, surface and the upper coarser uh, infill, which also includes in these circles archaeological material. And this boundary has been uh, formed apparently due to um, the compaction and the use of this uh, surface in everyday activities. Turning now to the construction, uh, to the constructed floors, uh, there are different number, a large number of uh, recipes uh, that has been used. Uh, you can see here different uh, types of materials. Uh, these are characterized are as relatively um, thick floors. Uh, they often include one, more than one of the layers that we can see uh, with the naked eye. Um, they are overlaid uh, and in this case we do not see any remnants of the human activities that they occur on them, so we can characterize as uh, clean floors. While in other cases we have a number, a huge number of uh, replasterings overlying the original floor. Um, this include a number of uh, different materials like uh, lime plaster, laminations, um, coarser sand, uh, or calcareous sediments. And in certain cases, we we'll have very fine fragments of uh, bones uh, in linear structure overlying these uh, plasterings. Um, or shells. Uh, in few, some cases, we have uh, charcoal. And we see here different ways of uh, the maintenance and preservation of the rooms, of uh, the floors and the rooms. It is interesting to follow these different patterns in space and see that even within the same room, we have different ways uh, of different recipes of uh, constructing the floors. So in this case, we see at the left part that they have uh, used the debris from the lime production, that is uh, burn um, marble fragments and lime nodules as a subfloor. In the right part of the room, there is evidence of uh, silty replasterings overlaid by um, uh, ashes and uh, shells. And in the middle, you can see these very fine laminations, uh, crusts that they are related to the stud to studying water. And we have found this type of uh, crusts in different uh, parts of the, the settlement that uh, um, are related to the presence of uh, pithoi or uh, storage vessels. And these have been interpreted uh, as wet floors where the pithoi would sit. Or um, in, other, in other cases, they have been interpreted as um, a result of the leaking of uh, the vessels, which would create the small puddles uh, around them. Another interesting point is uh, how these different uh, ways of uh, construction of surfaces could differ through time uh, in the same stratigraphic sequence uh, as the one you can see in this sample, uh, which looks rather invariable in the field. Under the microscope, we see uh, two um, floors constructed with uh, massive floors uh, constructed by lime with this uh, sand layer on top, a very fine crust with bone fragments sitting on top of it. These floors are overlaid by fields of different origin, but you see that at the upper part, the strategy changes to very fine laminations and uh, of one centimeter, um, alternating between coarser sand and finer grain material. And, um, these are covered by water lane deposits, uh, which actually close end the life cycle of this uh, room uh, because they are uh, most likely originate from um, water entering the room after the abandonment when the roof has uh, started to collapse and uh, water rain could infiltrate in the um, in this structure. Uh, we can see here how then uh, there is a change between the construction of uh, massive uh, floors uh, that they needed a lot of uh, effort and uh, finer, more perishable um, uh, crusts 
um, replasterings. We then turn to the um, last case of this study, the last case study. This is the tumulus of uh, Laona. Um, and the question here is uh, how micro scale can be related to large scale monuments. And this is a huge, uh, massive uh, structure of one uh, um, hundred meters in length. And uh, we can see here. Uh, we can see here the different, uh, in this impregnated slab, the different materials that they have uh, been used, uh, starting from um, these calcareous uh, soils, um, anthropogenic material, fine uh, marls, and um, uh, this coarse uh, volcanic gravel and decalcified red soils. Um, these uh, do not only demonstrate that there has been a number of uh, variability in the construction uh, materials, but there is also a variability in the construction techniques. We can see that this is a chaotic structure uh, reflecting a freefall uh, depositional process. Uh, in other cases, we have uh, um, more uh, sharp boundaries uh, and um, in this case, we see these uh, fine laminations indicating that these deposits were watered. And you can see how this uh, part of the sediment infiltrates in the lower uh, part of the section. Oh. I'm sorry, I have a problem with... Okay. <laughs> Uh, under the microscope, we see uh, some evidence of exposure, and this gives us uh, a um, possibility to reconstruct the different stages uh, in the construction of the um, mound. For example, we see these impregnated root tissues, uh, all these gypsum nodules in the right part of the sample, um, of the, of this right, uh, on this right sample. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but these are indications of the exposure of the sediments. These are a set of features that are uh, formed in the surface uh, of the sample. And um, since we have found them in, the, in different depths, we could uh, uh, reconstruct at least two stages of uh, construction of the, um, of the tumulus. Um, this is another example of what, how we have identified um, construction material um, which is seen uh, in this uh, circle. This is a wall plaster uh, fragment. Uh, this originates from the adjacent sediment of Haji Abdullah and um, it has been uh, used here in secondary use. And uh, in the next section, uh, we see fine laminations of uh, lime plaster alternating with, with uh, uh, fine uh, laminae of uh, soils. Uh, these have been uh, deposited using water and uh, probably a compaction tool. And they have been found in um, all the stages of, um, of construction, sealing the whole mound, probably as a result of uh, an effort of, for uh, insulation and protecting the um, monument. And uh, therefore, we see that there has been a very um, uh, careful selection of materials and uh, techniques uh, in an effort to uh, achieve the maximum uh, maintenance of this uh, very massive uh, structure. And all this was part of a very pre-planned um, strategy and um, uh, effort. This is the last uh, um, slide of my presentation. Concluding, I want to um, review uh, the fact that micromorphological analysis uh, can be used in a number of environmental, different environmental conditions, contexts, and uh, chronological periods, um, with the aim of uh, reconstructing the context of archaeological materials and uh, the fact that we want to reconstruct short-term uh, human uh, actions. Um, so thank you. I apologize uh, for this uh, bit confusing 
process, but I could also see my um, the application on top of my flat slide, so it was a bit confusing. Thank you, Mircini. Can you hear me? No? Angele? Τι πρέπει να κάνει? Πρέπει να ανοίξει τον υπολογιστή της. Να ανοίξει τον ήχο από τον υπολογιστή της. <laughs> Μάλιστα. <laughs> Hold on. Uh... Bravo. They can, they, the other person in the room he can hear us. So. Mirsili, τώρα μας ακούς. Ναι, τώρα σας ακούω. Ωραία, ευχαριστώ. Thank you very much. Let's switch to, to English. <laughs> Thank you very much for, uh, for, for this. Any, any questions? I, I have one uh, question. I, I didn't quite catch what you said about the first slide that you showed about Keros. Did I understand correctly that you said something about high energy water or was it just me imagining things? Uh, well, when we say high energy water is uh, related to this very fine, uh, uh, I mean, uh, op 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 opposed to the very fine uh, silky yes. um, sediments that are related to standing water. Then every now and then we may have some inflow from ra rain water um, that is higher in energy and All right. this will bring some Okay, so it, it was areas covered with water at some point. That's what you say, that you had some accumulated water in some cases, yeah? Yes, and this was quite thick deposits. Therefore, it means that the water was uh, had some thickness, I mean, some depth. All right. Uh, so the was exposed. Uh, it was probably totally open at some point. Okay. Yeah, that, that's interesting. That's what uh, I, I wanted to, uh, to, to understand. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, Caroline? Yes. Uh, we have a question from Katrina Grigorjeva. Uh, so the question is, the stratigraphy with floor fill, floor fill, how likely it can be interpreted as a several different stages of habitation of the room with interruption? Sorry, can I ask me to see? Can, can you repeat the question? Because I, I couldn't hear you as well. Ah, okay. Uh, question is, the stratigraphy with floor, fill, floor, fill, how likely can it be interpreted as several differ different stages of habitation of the room with interruption? Um, I think that the fields uh, in this case may not be um, may not be related to interruption, uh, but uh, especially the charred field may be a result of the raking out of the hearth. So the fields are also related to human action. Um, so I don't think they are related to interruption, but more like a sequence of different ways of um, using the room. Uh, with fields and floors um, following a continuous process, even using the debris uh, of the floor, sometimes uh, the fields of the floor, using them as um, a subfloor or a surface in some sense, of, which is followed by a more um, formal uh, constructed surface. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, she, she gave more uh, detail about her question. Can such interruption be traced somehow, or we simply do C14 analysis for every layers? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think the interruption can be traced uh, when we see um, refall re from the collapse of the room, uh, or in cases when we have uh, these, for example, these natural deposits that we see in this case, we can even see them uh, as uh, intervening layers. And in this case, we can understand that the room may have been partly abandoned or not well uh, maintenance. And in this way, we can have water infiltrating in the room and so on. Uh, there is one more question from Costas Pachalidis. 
so he said, if I understood well, your method can identify precise horizontal differentiation of stratigraphy. Yes, uh, that's true because we may have in the same room different in the same room uh, different um, sub uses. Uh, so, uh, as the example that I gave, uh, there is uh, some part of the room that uh, may include the wet floors uh, where the um, pithoi are sitting, and in other rooms uh, a hearth and the raking out of the hearth. Uh, so we can identify. Um, small um, sub-uses of the room in space and also, as I showed you, in time. This, these uses, I mean, can change through time. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mircini, how, how uh, because, I mean, now that you have explained the potential of what, uh, I mean, what uh, we, can, uh, we can learn from uh, micromorphology, uh, what's the, the most costly part of the, of the study? Or to put it in another way, is it is it very costly uh, to do such uh, such work? It is costly. Well, everything depends on the point of reference. I mean, it is costly, and it is also time consuming. I mean, it takes time to prepare uh, the um, samples, and especially when we go through such a um, uh, we want to trace each stage of the processing as, and we want to have control of the different stages so in this way it takes time and um, it is costly. I don't know if I have to go now into details but um, uh, the thin sections are prepared in the laboratories uh, abroad. We don't mm -hmm. have this option at the moment in Greece. Yeah, that's so what I was referring to, yeah. The first part of the processing is uh, completed in uh, the laboratory, but um, then we have to transport the uh, part of the slab as the, the stage that I explained. We mm -hmm. uh, have to, uh, they have to be prepared uh, abroad, and this is the cost part of the process. Any more questions? Thank you very much, Missini. Thank you for, for this, and we are going to be back in like 10 minutes, 8 minutes for the last uh, uh, lecture of, uh, of today. Thank you.
from uh, Dr. Tom Brogan, uh, the director of the Institute for Aegean Prehistory Studies Center of East Crete. Uh, hello, Tom, and uh, welcome. Uh, we're looking forward for your, uh, for your lecture, an archaeological biography of the Minoan household in their disciplinary approaches. Are you ready to start? So, Evie, could you, are you ready? Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> we are ready. Can you hear me? I can hear you barely. Yes. Okay, I'll start. Okay, yes, we are, we are all set. Please start. Okay. So, I apologize uh, for not being physically pleasant, present at the workshop today in Cyprus. Uh, the pandemic has upended my usual plans for participation and travel. Uh, but I hope that you're all safe and healthy in spite of the unusual circumstances. And I want to thank Tilo and Evi for the invitation. Uh, Evi asked me to contribute a paper highlighting some of our interdisciplinary efforts, excavating and interpreting Bronze Age houses on Crete. And in doing so, I'll be drawing heavily on the resources and staff of the NSTAP Study Center for East Crete and a joint study with my colleague, Krisa Sophia New, the director of the Lasithi Ephoret of Antiquities. Rather than present, uh, the techniques and results in a series of case studies, for example, what we do for botanical remains, what we do for uh, animal remains, or in the case, what Mercini just presented, the microstratigraphy or micromorphology, uh, I thought we might show you how we use them to interpret a particular context, a sort of summary of everything. In this case, a pair of 16th century BC houses from the site of Papadiokombos. And that's the site that you see on the screen from the north coast of Crete, and the arrow points to the exact location. Uh, and these were excavated by Crisa Sophia New. In effect, we've created biographies of these dwellings, which were just published in the proceedings of the University of Levan Lanouve's workshop on Minoan households, titled entitled Oikos, uh, which was edited by Maria Relaki and Jan Driesen. It just came out last month. So this paper is very much a joint effort by Chris and me, and, and we're both uh, authors of the, the paper. So Cretan archeologists have devoted considerable time in recent decades to the interconnected problem of the house as a physical space and the household as a family unit or social group. As Whitehaw, White Law observed, there's no simple relationship between people and the space they inhabit. Two influential studies have drawn attention to the potential of studying Minoan houses and households from the Neoplatial period due to the unique size of the sample. With more than 430 dwellings recently noted by Kostas Christakis. In his article from Sites to Communities, you see here on the screen, Whitelaw made a strong case that late Minoan one houses were occupied by nuclear families of four to five individuals, noting that any differences in house size more likely reflected elaboration in scale and wealth, as opposed to duplication of features, which might otherwise indicate the presence of extended families. His interest in this data was primarily to create a foundation for estimating the population of late Minoan one settlements. And this is, for those of you who are less familiar with that, this is the acme of Minoan civilization, the Neoplatial period, the 15th century BC. So taking a somewhat different approach, Jan Driesen considered the same data set in an article entitled Spirit of Place, Minoan Houses as Major Actors. With his characterization of Minoan Crete as essentially a house society, the concept of household or house took on a much wider meaning. Households were long lived, i.e. multi-generational and larger than dwellings of simple nuclear or even extended families. And in some instances, not limited to a single physical space, namely that they were multi-local. Now, one thing I observed at the conference was the presenters' conclusions were often limited by the poor quality of the extant contextual data for Minoan houses. First and foremost, modern recording methods have only used for just a small fraction of the extant neopalatial sample of more than 400 houses. Only a small number have been fully studied or published, and issues of preservation are no less problematic. In most cases, scholars are dealing with basement rooms of what were originally multi-storied 15th century BC houses. 
important upper story assemblages are typically missing. Some houses also were abandoned slowly and thus preserve incomplete records of the range of household activities prior to their abandonment. And this is, of course, what Mercini talked about earlier, but taphonomy and, and uh, site formation processes. Now, mock loss, which you see here on the right, a, a, a sort of aerial shot of the neoplatial town, provides an illustration of the problem. Excavations by Seeger in 1908 and Souls and Devaris from 1989 to 2012 recorded more than 20 late Bronze, Bronze Age houses, but only six were dug with modern methods that, conserve, that preserve a complete plan. Of these, only three were undisturbed by later habitation. And this brings me to the subject of today's talk, Papa the Ocumbos, the site of Papa the Ocumbos, houses A1 and B1. And you see the site on the left, uh, a, a view taken from a plane and a plan, which shows the houses in red, as red dots. Now our paper today takes a fresh look at the problem, examining the locus, form, and contents of the neoplatial household, or oikos, in the LM1 settlement of Papa the Ocumbos, to illustrate Minoan households in action. Recent excavations by Crisis Sophia New and the Lysithia Perea from 2005 to 2012 uncovered significant parts of three LM1 houses here on those dots, A1, B1, and C1, as well as their surrounding spaces. From the standpoint of formation processes, these houses are particularly helpful in addressing problems already noted in the wider Cretan sample. After their initial construction in the early Neoplatial period, so let's say the late 17th or early 16th century uh, BC, both structures were rebuilt in the 16th century BC following the Theran eruption, and then abandoned for good in the 15th century BC in what's known as the LM1B destruction, which was widespread and encountered across Crete. The presence of several meals in situ and large quantities of well-preserved pottery and metal artifacts, including bronze objects, copper ingots, and gold bars, suggest that the final abandonment was sudden and unplanned. Neither house was reoccupied or disturbed prior to excavation, and thus each dwelling offered a chance to record traces of the collapsed upper story that was also indicated by the presence of staircases. As such, the houses represent a significant addition to the extant late Minoan 1B sample. Our analysis essentially compares house A1 and house B1 through household biographies. An extensive survey of the site indicates that the neoplacial sediment covers an area of roughly 350 meters along the coast, stretching inland for another 100 meters. McCoy's bathymetric survey of the nearby seabed suggests that a significant part of the settlement, perhaps 10 to 25 percent, has also been lost to subsidence and changes in the coastline. Within the preserved area, a combination of excavation and subsurface analysis with radar and magnetometry, and you see the magnetometry on the right, uh, revealed parts of several LM1 houses in areas A, B, and C, and also evidence for nearby terrace walls. And you see the houses as black dots on the plan on the left. Now together, these slides indicate that the settlement was not arranged in dense blocks of houses, like those seen in the contemporary towns of Gornia, Moklos, and Palekastro. Instead, the Papadiokombo settlement employed a loose plan of isolated houses, spaced approximately 50 to 75 meters apart and surrounded by open terraces. And you see a plan of the radar. There's the house in, in blue surrounded by terrace walls with a garden around it. Now, micromorphological study of these terraces uh, at, in area C1 and A1 by Dan Fallou and Takis Karkanis suggests that these features had multiple functions as support for gardens near the houses and embankment to prevent flooding, that's what you see in, on the slide in front of us, from a stream running next to this house and perhaps even as property markers. Now a closer examination of house A1 and B1 reveals that both were built with local limestone to two stories on the exterior while employing mud bricks for the interior walls of the upper story. And here you see the plan of A1 on the left, B1 on the right, and aerial photos of the same uh, architecture below. In the case of House A1, upper story gutters were recovered on two corners. The plan of House A1 includes nine rooms and an exterior court on the ground floor. The court is on the lower right-hand side of the slide. Um, when 
as well as a staircase, here marked number seven, which provided access to the upper floor. The main entrance to the house was on the south side, leading from an exterior court into a paved vestibule room six, which you see also marked with entrance. Four doors in this room provided access to different parts of the house. The door on the northwest side of the staircase led into room five at your sort of lower center, a, a multi-purpose room, and from there into rooms one and two, which served as pantries for cooking and dining equipment and wine containers used in room five. So that's sort of a three-room suite in the lower left. A second door in room six led to room eight at the top of the slide, uh, which was a dining area, another large multi-purpose room, and from there into rooms three and four which again served as pantries for more storage and cooking and dining equipment. So you have two three-room suites repeated on either side of the staircase. A third door off of room six led to a hallway, room nine, which, was, which also led to room 10, a partially covered area outside the east side of the pool. House B1 employ, enjoys a more central location within the settlement, and roughly 75% of its original plan is preserved. The main entrance and some rooms to the northeast at the top of the slide are lost, but the internal circulation pattern is clear. An impressive U-shaped staircase with eight polished steps divided the house into two uneven wings. To the north lay room three, nine, 10, and 11. Very little of room three survived, but it provided access to room 11, a kitchen with a hearth and drinking vessel, and rooms nine and 10, which served as a corridor and another pantry for cups and stone tools. The suite of rooms west of the staircase include a sotto scala or basement room, room two, and several spaces for storage and craft. Room one, which you see here, is the largest space in the house, distinguished by a square pillar uh, placed next to a bench in the center and two rows of low flat stones that frame uh, the west and north sides of the room. In plan, the arrangement resembles pier and door partitions for those of you who are familiar with elite Minoan architecture. Room one contained a hearth with large furnace, several storage jars, and a wine pit. Openings on the north side gave access to room four with its collection of decorated pottery, which you see at the lower right, uh, and three more secure storage rooms, beginning with room seven, which contained this collection of denticulated foam sickle blades imported from the Cyclades. Room eight with a pithos that stood on a stone base uh, it was dedicated really for the storage, whatever the contents of this jar were. And then room five, which contained an impressive collection of tools for textile production, you see at the upper right, uh, and metalworking, which you see at the bottom. And we'll come back to these. Upstairs spaces were again recorded in the collapse. Now, we would like to take a more detailed look at the subsistence strategies of these households. And we begin with Evie Margarita's botanical study, which identified legumes, cereals and grasses, fruits and nuts in each house, primarily associated with the hards in rooms five, eight, and the south porch in house A1, and rooms one and 11 of house B1. Both houses contained lentils, ground emmer and chaff, olives and grapes in large quantities, as well as almonds. In other instances, certain finds were associated with only one building. In room five of A1, there were raisins and blackberries recovered, packed with remains of pressed grapes and mint leaves that may have flavored seafood stew. Finds in house B1, room one of B1, included peas, barley and chaff, figs, flax, and the possible remains of safflower. Now the terraces surrounding the houses would have provided ample space for gardens of fruit trees, almonds, olives, and figs, for the grapes, cereals, and legumes which were found in both contexts. Processing tools and storage jars provide a more detailed view of shared and unique activities in the ground floor spaces. Here we found large gornas, you see are mortars, stone mortars for crushing the olives found in the soil next to them in rooms five of house A1 and room one of house B1. We also found a saddle horn and a grinder, grinding stone in this one sitting on top of another, surrounded by the remains of emmer wheat next to an oven in room five of A1. This same pair of rooms also contained impressive evidence for wine production, including a raised bench, which you see at the back of the slide, which stood over a hollow in the floor for a basin that you see in the lower left in house A1, room five of A1, 
And nearby, we found the cake of pressed grapes, blackberries, and raisins, probably illustrating a strategy. This was Evi Margariti's idea, uh, where, whereby the occupants wanted to increase the sugar content to make wine with a higher alcohol level, which would have been stored in the medium so sized storage jars found at the south end of this room. Now, House B1 contained the same types of brownstone tools, but also sickles of bronze, like the one you see in the lower right, and these chipstone tools for pruning trees and probably for harvesting fruit and cereal. A bench in the middle of room one served as the base for a large clay vat for making wine, which was stored in the sets of pithoi, stored above and below ground in the same room. And you see the one on the upper left. Another large jar was provided with a stone base and a triton scoop in room eight. We saw that earlier. Mineralized grape skins were found in the pithos at the upper left in room one. Figs were stored whole and eaten in house B1, which was also contained barley, brought in in its husk and processed indoors with stone tools, and also flax, which may have been eaten, but also may attest to household production of linen from the processed plant fibers. Now, according to the, our project's zooarchaeologist, Dimitri Melona, the house also contains limited, the houses also contain limited evidence for animal husbandry and fishing. Animal and fish bones were not well preserved in the dwelling and almost entirely absent from the ground floor spaces of house B1, except for a collection of fish bones in room five. This suggests to her that the meals were cleaned up or perhaps eaten in, missing, in the missing rooms to the east or rooms that in the upper story. Preservation is not much better in house A1, where there were only two cattle bones, a moderate amount of pig, and goat and sheep, primarily goat. According to Melana, most of the surviving bones are tiny, eroded, and fragile. Therefore, their scarcity is more likely a matter of preservation than any indication of reduced consumption of these types of food. One deposit of goat bones found in room nine of A1, you see here in the photo on the lower right, is, however, more instructive. This concentration appears to come from one individual, and the anatomical parts and the pattern of burning on the bones suggest that the goat meat was stewed rather than grilled, which also matches the cooking kits in this dwelling, and we'll see those in just a little bit. Now, mollusks are the most numerous animal remains in both houses. In House A1, Milanos reports the molluscan remains on the ground floor represent 53% of the total. And you see the number at the bottom, the minimum number of individuals, over 8,500, so quite a large amount. Uh, while in House B1, they represent 32% of the assemblage, but a much smaller number, only 1,100. This suggests a heavier use of mollusks as food in House A1 on the ground floor. In this building, we observe what appears to be a primary deposition of marine invertebrates which were found in situ on the spot where they were left during the last episodes of food preparation, eating, and discard. This includes mostly top shells, limpets, and crabs, you see those at the bottom, uh, and a fair amount of sea urchin. In House B1, the, mol the molluscan remains on the ground floor appear to represent a general scatter of waste from seafood meals, but there were no significant concentrations of materials that were uh, like those observed here in House A1. So interesting patterns arise from uh, Milonas's comparison of the molluscan assemblages in the ground floors of the two houses. You see house A1 in blue and house B1 in green. The variety of taxa is much wider in house A1, which also has the largest quantities of marine invertebrates. In both houses, the remains indicate specific culinary combinations. We may indicate that. In house B1, limpets were combined with top shells and also with serrets and purple shells, which based on the number, fragmentation, and size, here represent food waste rather than purple dye production. And we're very interested in purple dye production, as you'll know from the conference we organized last year in, in Cyprus at the Archaeological Research Institute with Maria Jacobi. So in house A1, uh, in contrast, the dominant shellfish are the top shells, which are combined with limpets, crabs, and sea urchins. The combination of mollusks consumed in both houses, as described above, are found in the splash zone along the coast where they are collected easily by hand without any special skills such as swimming or diving. And this is a, these are studies that Dimitri Melanas has published. If you go to any of her recent articles, you'll see her emphasis on the efforts that were taken to find various marine species. So having looked closely at the evidence for agriculture, 
animal husbandry and fishing, we now turn to the ceramic evidence for food preparation and consumption within these houses. And here you see a, a slide, an experimental project organized by Gerilyn Morrison, where she tried to recreate the cooking equipment and the meals that we found in situ in some of these houses. So here we only, we only take into account the cataloged vessels, those with complete profiles that were probably in use at the end of the 15th century, middle of the 15th century when these houses were abandoned. House A1, which you see in the column on the left, contained 265 vessels, while house B1 on the right contained 176, but you gotta remember that we're missing some of the rooms from house B1. So it, it may actually have held about the same number uh, in, in the complete assembly. Now, when you're considering the evidence for cooking and eating, it's worth remembering what house A1, which you see here, uh, that it contained three rooms with cooking hearths, here marked in yellow. Minimal, uh, and, and cooking hearths and evidence for dining and, two, and four pantries, while house B1 had two rooms with hearths and minimal evidence for dining, just one pantry. This difference is also reflected in the number of cooking and serving vessels in the houses. Here, marked in red. House A1 on the left contained 31 cooking pots, uh, dishes and trays, and 22 serving vessels, compared with just eight cooking pots, dishes and trays, and 16 serving vessels in B1. The number of drinking and eating vessels was roughly the same, 82 to 77. The dining contexts of House A1, which were littered with food remains, also contain shapes like this cup raita, which you see on the upper right hand, which may have factored in the serving and consumption of seafood soups. And you've got to imagine these seafood soups were cooked in large uh, uh, sort of cook pots. And then these, these cup raita were, 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 were used as scoops to scoop out the shellfish. You put your finger underneath the vessel to plug a hole. And then as soon as you put the bottom of the vessel inside a cup, you release the broth. And when you had released all the broth, you could just throw the shells on the floor and scoop over again. So these are, these, these are very interesting. They fit with the, the activities in the house. And what's interesting is these shapes, such as cup raita, which are not very common, uh, were not found in house B1, where the, where the floor hearths were not associated with similar types of food consumption. So very specific kits of equipment uh, that match the meals that were being prepared. So the primary conclusion here is that house B1, which you see on the right, was operating in a manner typical of Minoan neopalatial houses. They tend to be relatively clean of food remains. House A1, on the other hand, on the left, displays unusually intense and messy behavior with large amounts of shellfish being served probably to large numbers of people. It was not possible to judge this behavior from the number of cups alone, uh, as the numbers were the same in both dwellings, but instead by the larger number of cook pots and dishes and the unusual amount of seafood recovered in House A1. This fact is also supported by our study of the Alamoan kitchen at Mokloss, where by contrast, each house at Mokloss only has one kitchen, which usually contain one to four cook pots, which is much more typical of Neopolish house. So this house having 30, more than 30 cook pots and three kitchens suggests an unusual amount of cooking activity. So, because of the precision of the soil collection, and here I show you room five, what was collected from room five of house A1, where each of these gray boxes represents a discrete soil sample, more than 20 were collected across the floor. By doing this, it was possible to deconstruct the last episode of food consumption within the room, in the house. So in, in room nine, we found what was probably a collection of shellfish that had just been brought in in a perishable container and left in the hallway before being cooked and eaten. And you could tell they hadn't been cooked yet because they hadn't been crushed. They broke them open when they ate them, okay? Then out on the porch in rooms uh, eight and nine, we found cooking pots full of shells over hard. And here you see on the right, the way, the way it looked in C2, this is after it was floated. These were the, sh the limpet shells from this meal. And this was a bronze knife found next to it that was probably used to scoop the meat out of the shells after they'd been cooked. And then finally in room five, where we found piles of crushed, discarded shells around hearths, okay? And this was true in both in rooms five and eight. And Dimitri Melana's study suggests here there's some depth to this pattern, which accumulated over a period of time, rather than just during the final few days. 
So evidence for craft production also exists in these houses. As Watrous and Heimroth recently argued for the contemporary town at Gornia, the occupants of most houses in neopalatial harbor towns appear to have been merchants involved in craft and exchange. Like those at the houses at Gornia, Catazacros, and Petras, the occupants of house A1 and B1 at Papaliokombos were both involved in the production of wine. Both houses also contained small sets of stone and lead weights, which were used for the exchange of commodities like metals. What further distinguishes the occupants of house B1 is the impressive evidence for the production of metal tools, jewelry, and textiles, none of which was found in house A1. Among the finds were fragments of copper ingot and strip, which would have been melted in the crucible. And you see an, an ingot fragment at the bottom center. Uh, and these pieces would have been melted in the crucible found in room five at the lower left to produce the chisels, daggers, and sickles that were found in the house. These chisels are interesting because they're woodworking tools suitable for both boat, furniture, and house manufacture. The other tools appear to be connected with agriculture. Small gold bars, which you see on the right, were found in a jug that had collapsed from the upper story, and these probably served as blanks to be melted again in the same crucible found in room five. Uh, XRF analysis by Alessandra Jumlia Mahir detected traces of gold and copper on the crucible's interior, and uh, we believe the gold was probably destined for use in a stone mold to make hoop earrings with grape clusters that was again found in five, room five. And there were again traces of gold in the uh, in the in the uh, in the jewel in the in the, the hollow section on the mold. So finally, House AB1 contained intriguing new evidence for textile production, including flax seeds. While the seeds uh, were found nearby a mortar and they, where they may represent food remains, it's highly likely that other parts of these plants were used to produce linen, which is commonly detected on Crete uh, in metal corrosion. Okay, so we think metal was often stored in linen bags. A set of 30 spherical loom weights, which you see both in the photo on the right and the drawing on the, on the left, um, these little golf ball shaped loom were recovered in room five in front of a bench that may have served as the base for a vertical loom. Their small size suggests the connection with the production of fine light fabrics. Two larger elliptical loom weights were recovered in the collapse of the partially preserved room four, where these may have been used for the production of heavier cloth. What distinguishes these small spherical weights, however, is their size and shape, which Joe Cutler has shown uh, in her studies of palatial textile production on Crete are generally restricted to context in North and South Central Crete. So we find loom weights in all of the houses across Crete, but they're usually the, the, uh, the, the discoid shaped weights with one or two holes. These, these melon shaped or golf ball shaped weights are, are, are more restricted and only in elite context. And this suggests again that the occupants of house B1 were merchants operating at the top level of the Minoan economy, something not easily argued for the occupant of house A1. So for the Oikos conference in uh, Belgium in the, that was just published, our paper explored the broad similarities and the real differences between these two structures, which are now published. Uh, in a nutshell, we suggested that the occupants of house B1 were merchants producing copper tools, gold jewelry, elite textiles, and wine which were highly valued and traded in Minoan Crete. House A1 offers a very different picture with evidence for exceptional quantities of food and cooking equipment and repeated sets of material culture. Both in architecture, there were, th there were two three-room suites on the ground floor that mirrored each other and probably upstairs we would reconstruct similar. So you've got four little three-room apartments more or less. So the question is, in, these, in the house A1, we think these repeated sets of material culture could be interpreted in more than one way. On the one hand, it's possible that the occupants of the house A1 were a poorer extended family, sharing what at first glance looks like a single large late Minoan house, but instead is operating along the lines of a known condominium or like a little apartment uh, at the edge of town. And we, we drew attention to that in this published paper. It's also possible that house A1 is not a house but as a gathering place for wider social groups whose nature still eludes us, where you'd have large groups of people meeting periodically and eating, consuming large meals in social sort of gathering. So 
In conclusion for this workshop, the Cyprus workshop, I thought it might be more useful to return to the processes that allowed us to reach these conclusions. In theory, we're talking about intensive recovery methods, which aimed at collecting both artifacts like pottery, stone and metals, and ecofacts like animal, plant, and wood remains by hand through intensive soil sampling, which you see here in quotation, uh, and, and to the point where we were gridding floors and collecting 20 discrete samples from an individual room. And now, as we just heard uh, Mersini uh, give a great paper describing through soil micromorphology and phytolith analysis of floor layers. We then bring a team of specialists to bear on these finds. For pottery, they include ceramic specialists and a petrographer, Eleni Navarro, in the lower left. Um, for lithics, uh, both uh, stone tool experts and specialists in phytolith analysis, where we take samples from the stone tool surfaces. For metals, the team includes an archaeologist, conservators, and specialists in XRF analysis. And on the lower right, you see Alessandro Junior Mayer, who studied those, the crucible and mold. For organic remains, the specialists in, we have specialists in zoo archaeology, botany, wood charcoal, and soil specialists. From my experience, it's not possible to know ahead of time or even during an excavation which techniques are going to provide the most valuable evidence. So you have to take a systematic approach to the excavation. Even then, each context or site can provide unique challenges. For example, adverse soil chemistry can cause you to have poor bone preservation, while the absence of fire destructions will resort in very little, if any, uh, preserved plant remains. Again, these are conditions you really can't predict while digging. Instead, you need to apply routine methods and see which work. For late Bronze Age context on Crete, these results have generally been good, although by no means perfect. For example, we've, rel we've had relatively little success with organic residue analysis of pottery or phytolith analysis of soils looking for microscopic silicate remains of plants and wood. But we have recovered great plant remains from soils, as you heard earlier in the paper, oftentimes when there was no visible remains of burning. Uh, and this is something when I was a student in the 80s, we only sampled, we only collected soil samples from burned areas. And I now am sure that that was a mistake. We missed things. You have to, you have to sample both burned and unburned soils. You just can't see all the, the areas of burning. So, the other particularly important step is developing a dialogue with these specialists while processing the material. This, conversa this conversation has shaped both the direction and intensity of the analysis that we presented here. And what you see are the results of these exchanges spanning several years of study. And I want to encourage everyone to, uh, to, to open up. You don't just give the samples to the specialists and then wait for your results. You really have to talk to them. And there's a lot of back and forth. To, as they tell you what they found, and then you sort of reevaluate other artifacts in the assemblage, and slowly you build that story, that narrative for the context. So that's all. Thank you very much, and I, I hope you guys all enjoy the rest of the conference. It's a great idea. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, and uh, I'll get uh, the opportunity to actually salute what you said uh, in, uh, at, at the end because we do have this dialogue for both Papadiokopos and the other, and uh, uh, Mesorahi and other sites that, uh, uh, you, of East Crete. And uh, it makes a difference to be able to actually go back and forth with information about the context. And uh, we usually come to the excavation and uh, we talk with, the, um, with you and the other excavators, so that's very, very important. Uh, so I open the floor for questions. Yes? Thanks, Tom. I very much enjoyed that. Um, surprisingly, I would like to ask a little bit about that crucible and, <laughs> and the mold. Um, firstly, I find it interesting. It's next to the loom weight on the, in the same building, at least, to the, the weaving productive activity, is it? In B1? I, I can't hear you very well. My, the microphone, I, I know you want to ask about the crucible. <laughs> OK. The, uh, do you hear me better now? Yeah, a little bit better, yeah. OK. Just a, a quick question. Do you think the crucible and the mold are in situ in primary position there? And if so, do you have any evidence from the soil sediments 
for metallurgical activity? No. So we, we think they were being stored there. That's the most secure room in the house. It has sort of four levels of security. And it was probably where they were storing valuables. Um, we did not, we found some interesting burned soil, intensively burned soil that might have been on the roof. So perhaps they were melting, there were melting fires on the roof where they would melt the raw materials, uh, either the gold to pour the earrings or the, the, the bronzes. These would be probably tin bronzes. Um, uh, but we did not find melting fires in situ. In fact, it's very rarely found in late Bronze Age levels on Crete. One of the best examples was found recently at the excavations, Watrous's excavations at Gournia. If you want to see it, there's a little article in the, I think our newsletter, the Kendro, in the last two or three years, the, the, the team that's studying that. There they actually found probably the site where they were melting uh, the, the metals. Uh, but ours, they must have been melting them somewhere, either outside or on the roof. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Thank you for, for uh, uh, giving us that very interesting uh, lecture from, from Crete. And um, I hope to see you all uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock uh, here and online. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah.